DM us if you'd like that document. Um, I, I can I can tell you that you know every one of us here have seen it, uh, all the mods and, and of course experience who's who's in the stage and then um, you know uh, you know Nate of course you know we speak you know regularly every night. Um, this is something that's very very important to understand that we are, may not be looking at uh, we may not be looking at these phenomena with the right glasses. I suppose you can see, say. Suppose that we changed the the hue or the, the color uh, of um, of you know of a lens in front of us, we'd be able to see it more clearly. And uh, not only is this true with science, but this is this is true in, in, in our entire world. Um, this this kind of phenomenon has been understood, you know, for uh, you know for quite some time, even in the you know in, in our last century. So I want to kind of make sure that we understand that. If we, if even just going back to the crop circles, if you look at this, if you look at this uh, phenomena in a different light, you'll actually see an evidence that is not available for something that is a hoax. I uh, just want to leave you guys with, with that piece. Thanks, I'm Data. Data, this is Mary again. I love that you said that because it was really interesting. Um, there was a group of us that was at this bonfire, and two of my friends that were there. You know, um, we meditate all the time, and psychedelics all that stuff and you know they're they're pretty awake and conscious and um i just really feel like all you have to do is really look up look up look up and and see like truly truly see and i was pointing it out to everyone in the group and nobody was seeing it except for my other two friends when they noticed it as well and with that said too nate were you able to what did you think about the videos that I sent you? I don't know if you had a chance to take a look at them. Uh, honestly, I cannot remember, Mary. I've received <laughs> I've received so many videos um, from people from these rooms asking me to see what I think. Um, can you? I'll, I'll go check the DMs and uh, I'll respond to you in a bit on here. Um, Apologies. It's been very, no a very, very busy uh, few weeks with trying to launch this podcast. And so uh, uh, bear with me. I'm doing my best, um, but I'll, I'll check them out um, if I didn't respond already. And I'm, it's actually funny you brought that up uh, to Mary, just the point with the cell phone is during that massive three day room that took place over the weekend with the New York Times article. Um, I was giving the explanation that I, I typically give to people, especially when they, they want to bring up the point of, um, you know, with the technology, the way it is and cameras, the way they are today, how come there's not more compelling footage and like, why does everything look like it was, you know, some eight bit, you know, photograph uh, from a Nintendo game type thing. And there's a couple of things that just have to be taken into consideration that nobody just wants to think about is that yes, the cameras on, uh, on the iPhones and, you know, even a lot of the Androids, uh, are phenomenal cameras, but they're all digital zoom. There's no optical zoom on any of them. Therefore, if you were to, most UFOs are not also flying, you know, uh, 20 feet in front of you, 50 feet in front of you, they're up in the sky, which is where most people are viewing them. And if they're fortunate enough to see them during the day, uh, then they'll stand a better chance of getting them. But even if they do, you're videoing something that is thousands of feet in the air, that is, you know, 40 feet long, typically, uh, which is a standard uh, UFO that we see, whether the Tic Tac or like TR3B type triangle uh, or a saucer shaped craft or the orbs of light. There's a number of things that are in the sky in various shapes. But typically, I mean, outside of the big motherships and a lot of the mass sightings that have happened, like the Phoenix Lights, uh, they're, you know, roughly 40, 50 feet um, you know, long. And you're going to try and film something without any type of optical zoom on a camera uh, that is, you know, 10,000 feet in the air, 5,000 feet, whatever it is. Uh, and you're going to then try and zoom in on that, and it's going to pixelate to high hell. You're never going to get a clear photo of it, and that's if you're fortunate enough to even be looking up at the sky uh, when that happens, where most people have their faces buried in their phone. Their consciousness is completely programmed to think that this stuff is bunk and nonsense, uh, hence the Robertson Report and everything I outlined in the opening monologue. And they're not looking, period. They're caught up in their day-to-day. -day. They're in big cities with light pollution, and they're, the last thing they're doing is sitting up, staring at the sky, pondering life. And... Therefore, the unlikely opportunity that you happen to be looking up and you happen to capture something or happen to see something, your initial reaction, I'll tell you this from someone who's seen a number of them, is pure awe and wonder that you don't want to take your eyes away for risk of you know missing even one second of what you're experiencing. 
But if you have the wherewithal to take your phone out, you're going to video it. And uh, most people aren't walking around with a hundred thousand dollar, you know, movie camera, like a Sony red or something like that. Like they have, they have a phone and no matter what, it's going to pixelate. It's not going to be compelling evidence. So this, this argument that like our cameras are so much better. Why does this exist? Yeah. Well, and, until you have, you know, like a hundred X optical zoom attachment on your camera phone, good luck getting anything that's not going to be pixelated. And furthermore, if you're doing it at nighttime, uh, nothing's going to show up. And I have a number of UFOs that I've seen that were very up close and personal um, on older model iPhones that I took on nights that the, the sky was so clear, like Mary was talking about, that the, the Milky Way was completely visible, so bright, so bright that, you know, it even illuminates the ground. And if you take your phone and you point it at the sky, it doesn't pick up anything. It's super bright to your eyes. It's clear. It's clear enough that it's, you know, putting off enough light pollution that you can see the ground. Uh, but your camera doesn't pick anything up. But then the objects that, that I've witnessed and clearly, you know, Mary's witnessed and a number of other people, they do show up. And they're very prominent and they, you know, radiate almost like they're, they're pulsating. I mean, I don't know. I haven't looked at the video you sent, Mary, but uh, at least in the ones that I've seen, it's, it's clearly uh, distinguishable and uh, separate from the massive sky that is painted with stars that is incredibly bright, that these things uh, are standing out uh, very much so and are able to be picked up. And once again, not compelling footage by any means. Uh, you're lucky that something even shows up on a, on a camera phone at nighttime because if anybody's ever tried to shoot something in the dead of night on a phone, uh, nothing shows up and that's pretty much how it is. But um, we are, uh, we, we've passed uh, hour one. Uh, Haley, do you want to uh, take away a quick reset now that we are officially on the way? This is Haley speaking. Charles is here. <laughs> sure. Um, I will do a room reset. Welcome to Nate Night Talks, UFO and Government Disclosure, a week in review. This is our weekly Monday night room where we highlight news and disclosure articles that have dropped in the past week around the world pertaining to UFOs and phenomena. We're focusing on a healthy dialogue and debate on a number of op-eds and articles released this week. We've been diving into the why around the timing of this release um, and how it posits in the broader picture, the article in the New York Times and the impending UAP report to be released. Um, it's been a hot topic in the hallway the past few days, but it's always in late night talk rooms. We have an amazing research moderators, all with unique perspectives and areas of expertise to dive deeper and broader, dissect through our own lens, information, disinformation, sharing facts, opinions, responding to some healthy questions, and inevitably raising some more questions. So we have Silva, Dada, Robbie, I believe Joe Cat has, oh, Joe Cat's down the bottom and Scotty has joined us. And of course, Nate, this is Nate's club. He runs this club with purpose and intention to share his deep knowledge and research on ufology, consciousness, the classified documents, AI, psychedelics and more. So I do recommend you follow Nate Night Talks and my co-mods if you enjoy the discussions here. It's the easiest way to be notified when rooms begin on Mondays, Tuesdays and Thursdays. We're actually growing rapidly and we'd love you to join the NNT community and contribute to the collective consciousness of our rooms. Um, we've been joined on stage already by some wonderful speakers and thank you to everyone in the audience for being here. We really appreciate you. We're an open space for people to share their research, their experiences, and for people like myself to ask questions and learn. So as long as we remain open-minded, inquisitive, and above all, respectful, you're welcome on this stage. Please keep your shares and questions short to a minute or so, so we give everyone a chance to speak and our mods an opportunity to respond. Uh, if you do attempt to derail the conversation or are disrespectful, you will be removed from the stage quickly. Nate has a zero tolerance policy for that, and so do we. So with love, um, let's get back to our week in the review. Nate, I will throw it to you to cap off any points and guide us onwards. Haley with the curls, done speaking. Beautiful. God, it saves me so much breath. Thank you. Um, yeah, all of that uh, with an exclamation point. Boom. Thank you, Haley. Um, we'll keep it going. I do want to welcome uh, Scotty, uh, last mod who popped in. Uh, Scotty, really quick, just because you missed the the intros, um, just a quick 20 seconds of your, your experience um, within uh, the various subjects and, uh, and, and why you're up here and fascinated by the subject. 
Hey, yeah, thanks. Uh, my name is Scotty. Uh, let's see, what can I say in 20 seconds? Uh, I've been into this since childhood. My father and grandfather helped build the lunar module and throughout my childhood and my teen years and into adulthood, both of them have told me that the technology that we see in the skies uh, regarding the NASA space program is, um, is nothing compared to what we really have. And this was back in the late 70s and early 80s that we were t when they told me this. And uh, among a few other things that they told me, also I've had uh, very personal encounters that I haven't really gone into too much detail here on Clubhouse. And because of those encounters, uh, my interest in this is very great, and I have been studying these things for a very, very long time. So uh, I have deep interest in it. I have a lot of respect for Nate and the way he presents the information that's here. There's a lot of rooms on Clubhouse, not to knock any of them, but um, the way we approach things here is not through uh, entire speculation, but through things that have been occulted from the not just from the U.S., but from the world, largely by the U.S. government. And, um, you know, I have essentially firsthand knowledge of um, of this by way of my parents uh, or my, 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 my father and grandfather, uh, knowing that there are things in the sky that do belong to us that look like UFOs and things in the sky that are definitely extraterrestrial. So anyway, uh, I'm here. Thanks for uh, I, I, sorry I was late, but I uh, appreciate the conversation and I will go back to listening mode. Aloha. Thank you, Scotty. Oh, with the ding at the end. All right, we'll keep it going. Uh, popcorn style. If you uh, have not yet had a chance to speak, please flash your mic. Uh, Christine, was that you? Hello, Christine. Welcome. It's me. Hey, hey, hey guys. Hey. Uh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Right before uh, Nate, uh, if I may, uh, if anyone wants to click on my profile and you're looking for that document, sorry for interrupting everyone. Uh, it, the link is in my profile that, that will specifically show you about the crop circles and the um, and the imaging technology used to, to determine whether it's a, a well, this phenomenon has been man-made or, or if it has been some other source. So I just wanted to put that out there and, uh, you know, happy hunting. This is data. Thank you. Sorry for interrupting. Hey guys, um, I would like to offer a, a kind of a, a layer that sort of synthesizes between some of the comments that was already made, uh, some of the things you were talking about, Data and Mary, and uh, so forth about like things we're seeing and why we're seeing, how our technology works, why does it work the way it does, why does it not, and that sort of thing. And um, so I want to briefly comment on that and then sort of offer a perspective for thought. Uh, but, you know, uh, you know, as Mary is like, as you're aware, and many of us are aware, I mean, why are these things all happening now, right? Because that's kind of the big question is like, where is this suddenly coming from? And as Nate has been recapping quite consistently about how, you know, this has gone on, the technology, the, a lot of information has been available for a very long time, but it's not been more mainstream. So why suddenly now, right? Well, we simultaneously have a substantial rise in consciousness. And when your consciousness is expanded, you have access to and capacity to um, be able to understand, view and experience and see and feel things in a different sort of dimensional or expanded consciousness dimensional reality. And so this, the concept of like, well, seeing something in the sky and knowing where to look. So we simultaneously, yeah, we have a better technology with our phones where we can capture some things and no, <clears throat> we can't get... Uh, the kind of data we would with extremely expensive lenses, of course, you know, the, on, on our phones. But part of it is being able, you know, like Mary, you're asking, why are you able to get one thing and not the stars per se? Um, the things go in tandem. When, you're expand when your consciousness is in an expansionism, then we're able to synthesize these sort of occurrences happening. So why are people suddenly having experiences and having feelings and having stuff? Well, collectively, we're having a rise in consciousness, right? And so as this is occurring, then our, our consciousness or our awareness, however you would like to you know, position that, comes into view of an, uh, an acknowledgement of something. We then have a reasonable technology available to us to then use that and direct that consciousness into the use of that device. So, you know, Mary, you're then picking up the thing that you, your consciousness is focused on 
lights in the sky, <clears throat> which isn't the same as focusing on the scars. So there's these sort of things, they work in tandem, right? Um, I do, I do want to kind of like comment because I haven't heard this discussed yet in rooms. And there's this sort of assumption that um, has been made that like any extraterrestrials are, um, that things are benevolent or are peaceful or there's no danger or there's no attack, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. I know this has been been said by a lot of different people. Um, it's a shared perspective by many, perspective. That, by many that like, okay, things are safe. But I do want to offer a perspective for thought around if we recognize that just, just as humans, just between each other, we understand about false light things and, and dark and light and entities and energies and different energetic frequencies, right, uh, on all levels, even, you know, from the scientific to the quantum. In some ways, and, uh, and I actually saw Eric Weinstein just joined the room, I was just about to comment, um, I really appreciated hearing him speak the other night, bringing in to the context the, what if we have access to multi-dimensional reality, right? And what, what kind of game changer is that if, uh, well, he was bringing up um, things about manipulating time and time then changes data and so on and so forth. But my point around the multidimensional reality and the access of that of consciousness is, uh, and I'm paraphrasing and I, I hate to paraphrase, but it's an Einstein quote around um, when we're trying to approach a problem with the same type of thinking that created the problem. I think that many of the conversations and though uh, there's so much intelligence and so much uh, education and research that's been showing up, but some of it still respectively shows up with the three-dimensional attitude towards what's probably a very multi-dimensional uh, situation or reality, whether you want to look at that as quite literal scientific dimensions or on a quantum level, or you want to look at it as uh, access to forms of consciousness. And so when we assume that the, any alien life is benign to us because it hasn't shown up as a threat. I think we're not taking into consideration the presence of different energetic frequencies. People who are more uh, spiritually or consciously minded are very, are very sensitive, are very aware of different energetic frequencies. And I think we have to start um, encompassing understanding and awareness around what integrating with these different type of extraterrestrial frequencies are really going to have an impact on our technology, on our world, how we're interacting with them, um, and not just from a three-dimensional perspective, if, if that's making sense. So it was a kind of a lot of information here, but um, I kind of just wanted to offer a perspective around we don't necessarily know that just because something isn't showing up in the three-dimensional attack mode that we aren't necessarily embattled with other energetic frequencies. We do know that consciousness is in a mass awakening, but we simultaneously also know that there are many people who are unconscious. And those who are unconscious then have themselves opened up to uh, be very inhabited uh, energies or bodies, so to speak. Thank you, Christine, and always good to see you. Uh, I'm I'm glad you know you brought it up, um, simply because the the notion once again, which uh, you know the, the media is not going to dive into any of this right now because they're still kicking around the narrative of, of what the government's putting forth is that we, you know we don't know if this is uh, alien technology uh, we do, we know it's not ours but we we don't know anything basically is is what they're they're getting to. Um, but within the the ufo community there is obviously a lot of a lot of talk um a lot of speculation that has been going around since the the dawn of this uh this recent disclosure over the past three years and the idea of you know benevolent beings versus malevolent beings and uh ascribing uh or assigning rather intent to anything like that which is hilarious uh, in, in many regards because who are we to ever even think we could possibly understand what uh, uh, an intelligence of that that level, um, uh, especially on any type of a uh, multidimensional <laughs> plane, if we're if we're going to go down that road, um, you know, it's the whole uh, you know ant hill and uh, and human kind of analogy. Um, we we have no idea. Uh, and even if the intent was something that was nefarious, uh, it would be on such a level that we probably wouldn't even understand it. It would be on the consciousness level that we most likely would be unaware of and being manipulated to an extent that we we wouldn't have any cognition of. Um, and it is a, a big component of it. And one of those deep dive you know, conversations that, uh, you know, 
really goes, which I wish is what, you know, the mainstream's not going to go there. I guess that's what these type of rooms are ultimately for. Um, though maybe not the Monday night rooms as much do try to kind of keep it more current event and not take people down these rabbit holes and just kind of discuss uh, what is actually going on, uh, the narrative being put forth, and then give a backdrop of the past 80 years so that people can better understand uh, the government's involvement in this subject, uh, which contradicts essentially their stance and what they're saying right now. Um, but I, I do think it's interesting. I, I don't want to dive too much in a rabbit hole, but I will open it up if, um, if Silver, uh, I know you dive into there, uh, into that subject a lot. Uh, or Shashank, I see you uh, unmuting a lot. If you want to quickly say something to it, and then we'll we'll keep it going. But I do want to, on Monday nights, once again, keep uh, keep, keep it a little more uh, 101 kind sure, of. Sure, Nate. Like, I'm sorry. I, I no, kind of no, really, no, I really no. intended to actually option and say, like, I think part of why so much is showing up is because when we're in this uh, collective consciousness awakening, right, that we're st- not only is the information coming up, but we have more of collective masses or having experiences. And then we have the technology to start talking about the experiences and that, you know, simultaneously puts additional pressure on, uh, on other, other, other agencies and other things about information. So, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to entirely derail that about the multidimensional aspects. Um, but just to say that, you know, consciousness is, a uh, having, having authority of your own sovereign consciousness, I think it's a very important tool going forward, regardless of anything that occurs, because it enables us to access and process information as well as be uh, independent and free will, you know, sovereign mind so that we can deal with whatever things may be incoming to us collectively. Could not agree more, Christine. And the and you just articulated something that is, I say all the time in these rooms that we echo is, uh, the basis of all this is consciousness, and what we are seeing right now is uh, a mass consciousness shift that is now accounting for this reality really for the first time. Um, and we're we're seeing the the impact of that. Uh, though right now it is more confusion than anything um, by you know the, the general mass public of uh, trying to account for this. But it has at least now entered that that consciousness space, and things are being opened up now in a way that I don't think they ever were. Um, which is going to give us the opportunity, I think, to, to better understand exactly what's going on. Because once this is accepted, once this is made a reality to people, and they realize that this is, uh, they've been here, this isn't new, this has been going on for a long period of time, and so what are we going to do about it now? Uh, and, and you know, hopefully demanding, you know, the, the full transparency from the government uh, and, and their involvement with this for the past 80 years, but I... I doubt that's going to happen but if enough people really wake up to this and 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 really embrace the reality and the implications of what it actually means like really actually think about the fact that this is the government's been aware of this for so long and have been dealing with it and deliberately concealed it uh in in such a, a damaging way um that uh you know we we hopefully can unite and and demand that that disclosure that real disclosure that i think people within the research this stuff have been really dying for the the real full story the real involvement and and really better understand and maybe they don't know that's something we've talked about before in this room is um maybe maybe they just don't know uh they still don't quite grasp it but based on the projects that have happened, uh, especially thing was like the, the Project Stargate and Gateway Experience, they understand consciousness. The, the, the alphabet agencies are very much aware of that component of it. Um, but whether or not it's a victim of you know the compartmentalization that uh, takes place across all branches of, of the government and intelligence agencies, uh, or whether or not it's just uh, it's been deliberately suppressed and they're they're pushing this narrative forward in a very particular way to frame it that this is new information and uh, and this is the they're slowly expanding the consciousness of, of the masses but based on the story they're telling which is why we're having this room is to make sure that the story that people get fed uh, that they don't take it for what it is, that they realize the story is much grander, much more incredible, much more amazing, uh, and is not, does not need to be feared as much, though there is positive and negative you know, energies in the universe. It's a, it's a perfect balance, and humanity and, and this planet is a microcosm of, of the universe at large. And so we know both of those energies exist. We know those frequencies exist. 
but we do not have to be victim of them. We can we can stay in a place of, of you know love and a high vibration and not be affected by the doom and gloom, the threat based narrative, and, and all the stuff that may be coming down and seems to be coming down right now from the the narrative at large. Um, but I know I and I think that's I think I think that's correct. It's mostly true. Like probably earlier on, it started as a as a relatively benign, well intended sort of uh, you know cover up operation intended to keep. Uh, the general populace, you know, from having a complete freak out, right? And that eventually, like any sort of lie, and the way the government certainly compartmentalizes things is very, uh, is very normal culture, that it's everything is on a need to know basis. But eventually, the things start accumulating, the data accumulates, experiences accumulates, and then simultaneously, you have this collect that again, the collective rise, um, and it gets to be a point where uh, <laughs> sustaining the lie is no longer tenable, right? Um, and, I, and I think that's kind of where we're at. So I also see a lot of interesting things with the data leaks. It's going to start feeling like a reverse engineering of embedding information. Uh, like it will start, to, I believe it'll start to appear as if information has been leaked much, much farther back than many of us have the maybe cognizance to realize. And so then it'll look like, oh, yeah, no, we kind of always knew. It was kind of always here. This was kind of always tucked in these little corners. So I, I think there's a little bit of like... Uh, reverse engineering intelligence also going on around that to try to kind of diffuse things. And I think that's been acknowledged with many of the files and things that were released in the last year over the peak of the pandemic. And so, you know, they're out there, but many people just uh, wasn't paying attention because it wasn't as newsworthy as other things. So I think we'll start to see a lot more uh, revelations around that kind of embedded material as well. Thank you, Christine. Uh, Eric, just want to welcome you to the stage really quick. Good to see you again. I know you have a lot to say on the subject, and as always, we're happy to hear it. Uh, I wonder if, if anybody has anything to say on the subject. The problem with the way in which this is leaking out means that we're all at such different levels of uh, exposure to the story, the data, how much time we've spent thinking about it. I am very much Johnny come lately to UFO land because I never wanted anything to do with the words UFO. I, I never even found it interesting as a kid because I just thought there was so much nonsense and garbage. And so it is only within the last year that I'm even reconsidering my position and feel very strongly that I have been propagandized uh, as I was about drugs. Um, and, for example, I, I used to think that LSD was incredibly damaging to the human brain. Um, I never believed that the Wuhan lab was off the table, but I watched as friends of mine, you know, were convinced that this had been debunked and that we had the Lancet's word on it. And watching people wake up from this very destructive kind of propaganda is what's giving me pause. Just... I think somebody said recently that there was a concept that, of course, the government would try to compartmentalize things, make things secret, put things on a need-to-know need basis. And, you know, for very brief periods of time, that can be true, like the Manhattan Project or, you know, other things of this nature. But this data belongs to us all, and it's not military data. It, if this thing is from some ideology that no one can make sense of, it belongs to science. And I think I'm just going to get more strident about this, which is it's not the military's place to keep the scientific data away from the scientists. This is scientific data, and we need it. And that's the end of that story. Hey, this is, this is Patrick. I feel like the, the last three speakers, we've all kind of danced around uh, an interesting question that I think is important to ask. Which is, you know, when we talk about, I think Nate said, and you said, like, you know, once this is accepted, well, what is the, when is it going to be accepted? Um, and you can look at that, you know, any way you want, as far as, you know, is there, is, what is, is, what is going to be like the precipitating event? Um, that is, is it the upcoming disclosure? Is it going to be something else? Does a UFO need to, you know, land at Dulles Airport and no, 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 no. people see it? I mean, so, what, what is it going to be? And what I would compare it to would be, uh, you know, global warming. In, in recent history, I, we know we've all lived through at one point, and I would assume it was coordinated, but at one point, 
the media, you know, kind of kind of stopped referring to global warming as a theory, and they took on a very assumptive attitude about it. So I just wonder when that's going to happen with this. Can I can I can I take a stab? And you want to stay with me yeah, in this no. frame and see if we can figure it out? Um, I think that this is actually really simple. What we what we haven't seen is we haven't seen a reconciliation of the two major narratives. One major narrative is a we have no idea where we are. This is some incredibly regular thing. It couldn't be in a more sensitive place because it's our military installations and it has particular affinity for thermonuclear weapons and it has abilities to shut down these things. And by the way, it's been going back for at least 70 years, if not longer, where nobody believes that the Russia and China had these kind of designs way back when. So, you know, there's that whole line of thinking. And then if you saw... I think Neil deGrasse Tyson recently on um, Joe Rogan and also this fellow Mick West, you know, they have this very different energy, which is, oh, people think that they've seen a ghost and it's just Venus or, you know, it's, it's birds wrapped in a mylar balloon and, you know, it, it could confuse anybody because you don't have, you know, parallax is confusing and, well, these various narratives are going to collapse. There's no way. Right now we're in a period of narrative avoidance. And the analogy I've been giving people is that before January 6th, we had stop the steal as one narrative versus certify the electors uh, in the election as the other narrative. And those two narratives couldn't avoid each other beyond January 6th. So of course January 6th had to be a date of narrative reconciliation among other things well whatever the date of scientific reconciliation of the ufo narrative or the uap narrative hasn't happened yet if you if you go to a relevant science department and you start asking the most trusted senior people in that department where they are many of them don't even know that the UFO UAP story is, uh, has changed because they must not be listening to NPR or CNN. I mean, I think one thing I discovered is that my scientific co colleagues have tuned out to an extent I had never imagined. And th these narratives are about to collide when we get a claim that someone will make in, in an aerospace company, someone will make in the Pentagon, and some physicist or some engineer will step in and say, actually, that's gobbledygook, that's nonsense, we're having none of it. And then you're going to see sparks fly. And the thing that you can say at this point is, the scientific community hasn't shown up yet. Like they, they, They're effectively nowhere to be found. It doesn't mean that there aren't individual scientists, like Avi, Avi Loeb, or obscure scientists like Hal Putoff and Eric W. Davies. But the general scientific community somehow is not engaged. And I would say that what's, what you have is you have a January 6th for UFOs coming up. I hope that's the case, Eric. I, I really do. It, it seems like to me that, you know, to, to answer, you know, even Patrick's question, I believe that was Patrick, forgive me if that wasn't, um, is it almost seems like we have a, a Stockholm syndrome of consciousness, if you will, that the government has maintained such a, a close, tight grip uh, on, on this narrative of this subject matter for the past 70 years, but in particular since, you know, the mid 70s, that people's conscious thought is so trained to react to this in such a way that it's hard to change it, even with new new evidence being put forth uh, by the institutions that they have relied on to give them factual information, which in and of itself is flawed uh, and their track record really speaks for itself. But I, I feel like it's, it's almost this needing, this clinging to this, this past narrative. I mean, ego, I think is a big part of it. There has been uh, many, many people across all communities, across all professions who have uh, historically and habitually uh, shit on the subject matter for lack of a better word. Um, and it's going to take a lot to undo that. Uh, and a lot of people I think are going to be begrudgingly going forward. And I think ego is, is something that is going to be playing a part in the, the speed at which that takes place. 
But with more of the bombarding that's happening from the media and the government at large on this subject and these new 120 cases that are going to be coming out here at the end of this month, um, it might galvanize, uh, hopefully, enough in the scientific community, depending on what conclusions are ultimately drawn, because right now it is very ambiguous uh, within the headlines and what the government is saying, right? It's, and they're like, well, we can either confirm nor deny. I, I don't think so. I don't think it's ambiguous. I think what they're doing is they're telling us it's little green men, and they're doing it by making sure that every other hypothesis that we come up with um, they can spike, right? So if we say, oh, well, it's only video, dude, you don't have radar, then suddenly we're gonna get a radar dump. And if you state, you know, well, it's only low resolution, eventually you'll get high resolution. And by the way, I also don't think that it's that the government is keeping the secret. It is that whatever these things are and the government are together keeping it secret, right? In other words, if you think it's little green men or if you think it's the Russians, or if you think it's swamp gas, whatever it is, is not so ubiquitous and so easy to photograph that a world of sensors has been able to record it. And so, and, and let me just say something else on the consciousness front. Many of us in science are put off by the consciousness discussion. We probably shouldn't be, but we're put off because it takes place in, and this is like really tough to talk about, it takes place in what I call Marin County speak. Right. And it's, you know, oh, you know, I was readjusting my chakras and, um, you know, I, it was all about set and setting. And, you know, I went on a journey with this person and I felt his ancient wisdom. And OK, well, it turns out that there's actually a lot in that stuff. But if you think about the way in which your your, your waiter tries to sell you on your food or your wine. Oh, this is lightly kissed with a playful such and such sauce you know, uh, that, that plays on your tongue. Well, that's sort of somebody's trying to seduce you. And if somebody's saying, well, okay, if you look at the acidity and the amount of sugar that's been converted to alcohol, that's sort of what more like what you, UC Davis would be doing when they were making wine, whereas the French were going on about terroir and about the, the majesty of French soil. So in a certain sense, part of the problem is, is that we're gonna have to convert the content out of woo speak and into something that sounds more like, you know, a gas chromatograph or, you know, some sort of, uh, some sort of radar. Whatever these things are, the, the nature of the, of the conversation has to change. I don't think I understood the consciousness piece until somebody more or less indicated to me that they felt that our theories of physics were probably too impoverished to support an emergent theory of consciousness. In other words, there's a question, since we don't understand consciousness, is consciousness emergent from that which we already understand? Or do you need a new level of physical understanding before you can get consciousness to emerge natu naturally? So for example, if, 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 if it was intrinsically quantum and you only had Newtonian physics, then consciousness would be seemingly not physical right up until the point that you had an advanced, a more advanced theory. And I think one of the ways when people start talking about vibrations and energy, and by energy they don't mean Hamiltonian, um, then we get into this weird area where people are sort of saying stuff that sounds like it rhymes with, with, with what other people are saying, but we're actually having very weirdly divergent conversations. And I just, I don't know when that's gonna happen. I, I agree. Here, I, I just, just want to finish that thought really quick. Could I quick. speak that, for a second? One, it's one Chris second, Stapp. Chris. So one second, really quick. Um, with within the the consciousness component, and we do have the science. And obviously, it's it's closely related to to quantum physics. And as you you're aware, I know we've spoken in other rooms about this. You know, things like Project Stargate and the Gateway Experience, where this level of consciousness was taken seriously. It was taken away from Wu where there, there are respectable scientists who have studied it, and we need them coming forward now more than ever because a lot of what is being talked about both in the Wu community and, in the, and by quantum physicists is 
virtually the same thing packaged different with a, a slight different understanding or interpretation of it, but nonetheless, an incredibly relevant component to, I think, fully understanding what it is that we're kind of dealing with. But it has equally suffered from from stigma uh, and from various, you know, aspects of, of culture and pop culture that, you know, have uh, framed it in a particular light. But it's, it's nonetheless suffered in the exact same way. And we have to change that view on it in order to bring it, you know, in into the purview of everybody uh, for this debate, for, you know, this inquiry into what it is that we're dealing with. And it's a shame that it has been uh, stigmatized that way, that that is the knee-jerk reaction by the scientific community to it. Because, yeah, a lot of people turn off. They won't even touch it. They'll leave the room. It's like, nope, not going there. But there are scientists who, who do study this and do go there, but they're – they call it by a different thing. They frame it a different way, but nonetheless, it, it seems to be focused and revolving around the same kind of phenomena. Would you agree with that? Well, I don't, I think I want to hold off here. You know, I've been trying to talk to people about this from a science perspective without being disrespectful of the f fact that many things start as a hunch or as woo before they become understood and made scientific. So it's not like, if, if you can't get your stuff in a scientific frame on day one, it, that's not a bar. But the, um, what I've been told is, is that if you, the more you stay in UFO land, the more you realize that consciousness is part of the story and it's inextricably part of the story. Now, certainly in terms of things like evading, being detected, um, that feels to us like either these things are consciously piloted or they were programmed by a consciousness and are me mechanistically behaving in an as-if conscious frame. Um, then I hear stuff about, well, if you can actually call these things and if you set intention, you can will things into being. And of course, this makes me run for the hills because it sounds like, you know, Oprah or somebody manifesting things in their life. You know, I thought about a car and then a car, you know, manifested in my life. And it's like, well, you, you were talking about a car and then your parents bought you one for your birthday. So I don't know if I want to call that <laughs> manifesting. Um, but I guess, you know, in part, one of the things that you have to appreciate is that people who are actually in science as a profession, are allergic to ever being even once taken in by an old wives' tale or a ghost story or some sort of fabricated thing. In other words, the costs to somebody with a PhD for falling for this stuff when it's a, a scam are so catastrophic that um, they can't even listen to you most of the time when you're trying to say something. It's just some, something to be, keep, keep in mind. Eric, this is Christine. You know. If I could just comment really quickly. Um, and I, I appreciated, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Krista. You can go after me uh, real quick. Um, but I appreciated what you had said uh, in a previous room a number of nights ago, kind of around some of the stuff with the consciousness element. And I think I, I, you bring up a very good point, a very important point. And I... I um, I'm a huge advocate about discussing consciousness. I bring it up all the time. I mean, it, it shows up in pretty much everything. Um, but I have come at that very much from a scientific perspective first, because I understand that when we have this severe dichotomy of things at either extremes, the other audience of one end won't uh, hear the other things um, because of just like the linear thinking versus um, the other more, you know, theoretically expansion thinking um, it, because it has those sort of cliche tropes attached to them. So I think part of the paradigmal shift that we need collectively is new languaging around synthesis between understanding what the terminology is on a physics and a quantum level. Um, because, you know, at one point in time, I mean, I'll, I'll remind, and especially like in medicine, um, you know, I can't remember the doctor's name, but there was a, the, the particular individual who started to believe in bloodborne illness and that there were these tiny little organisms or microbes or things that were in the blood that though we could not see them, they were poisoning people or they would harm them. And so this particular doctor was encouraging other doctors to clean and sterilize between surgeries. And this was a guy who was actually locked up and died in an insane asylum because, you know, this is that thing. It's like the 
consciousness and some of the quantum theory has to do with the unseen world. And at some point in time through uh, experience in our own just evolution, like as humans, um, we come into awarenesses of things, but we aren't always of the technology or capacity to demonstrate them in the physical world on an evidence base, which is then the other direction that's more farther purely scientific that's evidenced, you know, trial and error based. But at some point we gain access to the information and obviously we know bloodborne illnesses now, but once upon a time, the individual who first, you know, cooked up the idea was considered a person who was insane. Um, and it's, it, it's a shame. And so I'm not saying this is the same situation, but we do see that these things over era of time, as we progress, um, we have to find a kind of a, a harmonious balance between intelligence the, that synthesis of the one side to the other side so that there can be, um, you know, constructive discourse uh, in, in how those things actually intersect. And we start moving from a non-dual, uh, you know, from a dualistic reality to a non-dualism and understanding that everything actually has an interconnectivity and that we could be working with how to okay, synthesize but, between those. But, but Christine, just stay, stay with me for one second while I respond. Absolutely. Um, I don't think that's where we are. I think that the issue is is that if you had a bloodborne hypothesis, you'd be trying to get blood under people's best um, detectors. What you know, if they had microscopes, then let's look at under a microscope or let's do some chemical tests on it. I think the idea that somebody else has my data and they want me to comment on it and they don't want to show me the data is just like, pretty please with sugar on top, get these people the hell out of my way and give me my data. And I don't want to have a conversation where you get to look, look. At some point, I took the graduate record exam to get into graduate school. And there was a, a math question on it. And I said, that math question is ambiguous because it's a word problem. And you didn't realize that you linguistically encoded more than one problem through sloppy language. And what they said to me was, well, we can't release the problem. You have to complain about it from memory. And I said, you've got to be kidding. So, you know, there I was where they were looking at the problem and I had to make this assertion from memory. And eventually I got the problem actually changed and switched. But it was just the most unfair thing in the world where one side had access and the other side had to treat it as behind a wall. And, and that's where I feel like I am with this. I, that's my data. And you've got my data, and I need my data. And go get your mommy to get you, get you permission to give me my data, because I can't help you. There's no point in training American scientists with taxpayer dollars if you're going to freeze them out of their own data on the most consequential assertion that I've ever heard. I mean, no part of the story makes sense. Krista, I, Krista, 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 was, Krista was cut off twice. Krista, please go. Hi there, everybody. Um, hey, Eric. Um, I'm from Marin, and I teach chakra meditation. So I had to laugh when I heard you say that. Um, with that being said, um, it made me think in terms of how consciousness comes through and information. And I was really speaking, I was really thinking about like the Upanishads. And all the information that came down through the Upanishads was downloaded. It wasn't anything that they researched or looked for or anything. They waited and it came through. Just as I think you get scientific notions that come down and you connect dots and you make assertions and you figure out theories and what have you. And I go back to the time in the 50s when the government came in and I don't know what was going on, but they started to infiltrate fluoride into our waters, into a lot of different things. And I think you must know about this, but fluoride can calcify the pineal gland. It can begin to like block our ability to actually see and to have that sense of intuition to allow the consciousness to grow and to really come into further assumptions. And so I feel as if there's been a time period over the last 50 some years that we have been blocked to a various degree not to see, not to know. And this has been a birth given right to all of us going way back to the Upanishads, way back to you know, all the science that's come through has come through that assertion, that intuition, that sense of knowing. And there's been some blocking on that front. And I don't know if anyone else wants to speak to this, but um, this is something that we're using psychedelics for to uncover, to dislodge, to get back to that place 
that's our birth given right and that consciousness. And I think we're moving from this third dimension to this fifth dimension, bypassing the fourth, which is, you know, governed by Saturn in time, because that's where a lot of the science people and government are working so that we can see. So I think people who are willing to jump from third to fifth can actually see these UFOs. Those who aren't and want to stay in this third dimension aren't going to see what's happening out there. So that's my feeling. And I'm Kristen. I'm out. Kristen, okay. this is Taylor in Natafield. Eric B. Respond, oh, respond oh, to sorry, Kristen real briefly. Um, I may be forgetting what I was going to say at this point, but Chris, you made a really good point that we are jumping the fourth D, that we are jumping time. And I do want to preface and say there is a certain percentage of truth in every word, every word ever spoken, there's a certain percentage of truth in every word ever spoken, whether on the scientific side, whether on the spiritual side, consciousness. The thing is, with this whole disclosure, it's going to be multi-layered, and it doesn't. It has to go hand in hand with the rise of consciousness. It has to go hand in hand with the awakening that time is an illusion. Time is not linear. The past is not real. Tomorrow's never promised. All we have is now. We live in the eternal now. So when that really is brought to light even further, they'll just, you know, in my opinion, layer in the, the facts of the disclosure and say, oh, it's, a, you know, it's all good. Time never existed anyway. So we're learning that. And now we're learning this and we're all learning together. Um, so yeah, that's my two cents and a little bit more. But Chris, I really liked what you mentioned. This is Silver. Let me see if um, I don't know if we totally lost Eric, but you know, just from a scientific perspective, I do want to take it back to to um, thank you to Buddhism for a second because essentially the Buddha said, "Do not believe me. Do not believe anything I say. Don't believe you know the places, the stories, or anything that I talk about. Try it. Do the meditation. Do these breathing exercises." you will have the experience that you have, and then we can talk about it. And ultimately, that is a 2,500 year long experiment. There are a lot of other experiments that have been going on for longer. Uh, the Jewish tradition has uh, a, a very um, deep tradition uh, of storytelling and, um, and meditative practices. And you know, if you wanna use non-dualism, it's a fantastic way by eliminating uh, different, you know, dimensions so that you singleize, singular uh, yourself down uh, dimensions so that you can kind of experience the, the oneness that's through meditation. You know, you, you have many, many, many different ways of experiencing these meditations um, that all kind of deal with non-dualism. It's, you know, paring things down to simplicity, down to a, a singular dimension to experience uh, everything and then moving outward and upward from there to experience outward, you know, fourth space from dimension in and out. We accept that mathematically. Why don't we accept it from a consciousness perspective? That's science, that's math, that's geometry, that's reality. And then you can go from non dualism back through the upper dimensions and outward to experience a choice to see or not to see, to believe or not to believe, to accept or not to accept and open your mind to, you know, things that you would not have believed before, which is what's going on. And this information is nothing more than information that allows us to talk about things that we could not talk about before because it was a no go, a no fly zone, a no consciousness zone. So I'm silver. I'm complete. I, I, wanna, I do want to bring, I don't want to go down a tangent. We obviously lost him, which, you know, try to keep the conversations on Monday night more on an actual grounded standpoint for people who are newer to the subject to discuss, discuss the last week and review as it pertains to the government's disclosure and trying to have engaging conversations that uh, don't go down rabbit holes um, that people who are not very deep into the subject matter uh, would understand. And so I do want to reel it back in. Um, we did lose Eric because of that. Uh, that we keep it more uh, on topic um, within the, the premise of the, uh, the initial statement made at the beginning, which is better understanding the, the why of now, the why of everything that is taking place 
Uh, there are different rooms that uh, we hold where we can do deep dives into uh, consciousness uh, on every level. Um, we always want to interject it into everything because it is the, the fundamental basis for everything that we're talking about in here. And the, uh, the most key component for understanding the phenomena uh, as, as a whole. And if you miss that part, then uh, the rest of it's not going to make any sense. But we do have to, you know, always know our audience and be very careful uh, and meticulous and discerning about the way we present these notions um, as to put them out in a coherent way that uh, people who are newer to the subject can uh, digest easier and that does not turn them off uh, quickly. So I do want to reel it back in. Um, we'll keep it going popcorn style, but um, I do want to bring it back more to uh, the initial topic of the room, which is the uh, as it pertains to the, the why now within this disclosure, um, as it pertains to the government's involvement in the past 80 years within the subject matter. Um, and everything therein so that we, uh, we, we stay on task a little bit more um, and don't go down uh, the, the consciousness rabbit holes on a Monday night. Um, that being said, we'll keep it going. Uh, Popcorn Style, who has not yet spoke, please flash uh, away. Most Nate, oh, do you mind if I add something, Nate? Sorry. Um, who's that? Uh, this is Danny. Flash my mind. Is it on topic, Danny? Um, yes, it absolutely is. All right, Danny, then uh, Masan, or Masan, you go next. Hey, guys. Hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, I kind of wish we wouldn't lose Eric because uh, I guess my subject matter was a little bit more specific to the subject and uh, uh, also kind of going to the core of what I believe the problem with these kind of conversations usually is. I don't mean this particular conversation, but conversations uh, pertaining to the subject matter, usually the way that it goes. The way that I see it, and uh, this is I'm speaking from a somewhat difficult position because there's certain things that uh, there's certain things that I'm aware of that uh, unless I have people in the room and unless I have like a, like real proof to show them, it's kind of uh, it just makes me sound like a wacko. But um, I've actually contacted a few research labs so far. So far, no, no, uh, no answer, but I'm sure it will come. What I wanted to raise is this exact link between the way that the conversation is being done. Uh, I believe I'm, I'm a meditator myself. I've been practicing for many, many years. I think that there must be a place to stand in the middle somewhere where people like Eric can hear something being said and not automatically assume that there's something there that is being missed. And I think the main issue is certainty. When there's a certain certainty uh, with uh, people's claims, without the courteous uh, offer that this is that they understand that it's not the way that everybody perceives the world, it automatically shuts off any kind of real conversation on one side. On the other side, uh, when you just want to go about it in a very cold manner and you're just trying to describe the, describe the world through um, completely scientific means or at least the way that scientific means are described today, which means we, we, autom we by default, trying to go about and explaining it through only what we know, which is physical matter, uh, we run into a serious problem. So now... I have no idea. I, I mean, I, I honestly not really sure even how to talk about the deeper subject. So I'm not even sure that I'm going to fully raise it. But I do want to say that. Um, let me okay. Let me let me ask you a question, Nate, because I've I've never been to this channel and I've been here before. What? How would you cons What would you see as actual evidence, hard evidence that we can talk about in real terms of the other, whatever it might be, if those are extraterrestrials, if those are us in the future, whatever it might be on the other side, what would you personally consider a hard enough proof to take to a lab to talk about it seriously? Well, it's, uh, I mean, uh, there, there's an embarrassment of proof. Uh, this is uh, an issue that was raised in the three-day room that took place over the weekend as it pertains to the uh, New York Times article and that uh, the, the scientific method um, really fails when it comes to this. It might not be the, the best tool to use.
because how are you ever going to uh, scientifically test something that is intelligent, that is beyond an intelligence that we can even comprehend, uh, and that is not going to just sit in the lab and allow us to uh, perform certain experiments on it. What we can do, though, is we can do any form of field of research and investigation. Uh, and if we're talking about the amount of evidence that would be needed to uh, convict a person of murder in a court, we have a thousand times that that exists through declassified documentation, through uh, witness testimony, expert testimony, uh, military officials, uh I mean, politicians, not that these people, this is the irony is that we, we put so much weight into this as if there aren't people in the private sector that are uh, intelligent and capable observers uh, who've had these experiences. But if we're looking strictly just at the UFO phenomenon itself, we're looking at the embarrassment of evidence that exists, not just within the past 80 years as it pertains to the U.S. and our government's involvement with it, but governments around the world. This is not unique here, but as it pertains to this current disclosure that we're experiencing in the media right now, this is very much a U.S.-centered thing uh, because it's coming from the Pentagon and the DOD. But we know our involvement in it. We, we, we can read the reports we have. That's why we have people like Data up here who's you know, one of the top five hackers in the world who does contract work for the intelligence agencies. And we can see these things, we can read them, and we can be very much aware of their involvement with this uh, since, you know, basically the 40s and how seriously they've taken this subject matter in a very clandestine um, uh, special access program kind of way. That in of itself, uh, not to mention the, you know, millions of reports uh, that have been documented throughout every country uh, of this subject matter on an official record uh, from government studies, such as, you know, obviously Project Blue Book being the big one here that people are aware of, but the Cometa report in France, uh, the MOD did their own where they declassified roughly 10,000 UFO uh, reports in the early 2000s. Uh, South America, Central America, Mexico uh, have been big hotspots. Canada has admitted their involvement with this for the past 70 years. There is an embarrassment of proof of this. Like the, the evidence from that standpoint, and uh, once again, um, if this was any other subject matter, if it was any other thing, it would be taught in academia. It, w it would be something that is taught in schools because of how much you know evidence that exists as far as uh, everything from experiencers. We haven't even talked about the abduction phenomenon, but that in and of itself, if it also wasn't stigmatized to high hell, that would be taught in psychology courses and psychiatry around the world. Millions of people around the world who've all experienced basically the exact same phenomena uh, within the abduction world. Everything from the scene, pretty much one of three groups of aliens that perform these things. Uh, stereotypically, we all know the greys, the short little grey guys, um, experience the same type of reproductive tests that happen, uh, et cetera, et cetera. People from different cultures, different ideologies, different backgrounds, uh, different experiences, different upbringings, all share the same thing. That is profound. That is crazy. That is something that can be studied, but it's not studied. That is evidence and an embarrassment of it, even if it were to turn out to be some type of a psychiatric disorder, which I, it's not. And there are, you know, a lot of brilliant people like Johnny Mack and Whitley Strieber who wrote books about this stuff, and Harvard educated people who investigated it. But if it was any other subject, uh, the, the case would kind of be closed if there is something here. And then we go back into ancient history. If we look at the very origin of our species, we look at uh, things referenced across every religion around the world, you know, flying machines in the sky, the gods and lowercase g's that came down to perform miracles, you know, uh, atomic bombs that were dropped. I, I mean, it's, there is so much, if, if you take the macro look at all of this stuff, uh, I, there's nothing that needs to convince me. I, I've spent 12 years researching this. Uh, I, I, the evidence is clear. Um, but if we're looking at the, the scientific method, uh, which is the, you know, the debate I got in over the weekend. What know, if I tell, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. What if I tell you that I find a way to triangulate an experience that you can verify in real time with multiple people in the room? Well, I would be interested to hear it. I mean, you can, these things are repeatable through firsthand experience. I mean, you, that is why the whole Stephen I, Greer CE5 I, protocol. I mean, a hundred, I mean, a hundred percent repeatable. I would be very interested. I'm sure the scientific community would be as well. Well, well maybe so they, far, I, I would say, yeah, I would I say I believe you. It hasn't been the case. Go ahead. No, sorry. I don't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. Yeah, I would, I would say I believe you, and I have the data to prove it that it's already being done. I don't think it, so. I would I would say that there's research right this so so the the I would have the research data to to show that this what you're talking about is being done there's patents what? that actually have been filed for what you're actually saying uh, can be done uh, so these kinds of things are are the kind of information that we're trying to share but again not to derail anything 
uh, so we can get back to the discussion. Nate, to you. Well, really quick. I mean, uh, what what is this, uh, Danny? Uh, do make it quick out of respect. For, I want to get to everybody. Absolutely. And I, I'm not, and I, I apologize to everybody. I didn't mean to hijack the conversation. Uh, honestly, um, so this is, this is where it gets a little novel and interesting. Also, why I open myself to rapid fire. But um, very shortly, if you're really interested, uh, you can drop me, whatever you're comfortable with, you can drop me an email or whatever it is. We can discuss about it a little bit more in length. Uh, I do have hard data to support this. I already uh, actually contacted Johns Hopkins with this and uh, David Chalmers. Uh, so far, no contact. I do have some uh, friends who actually know Eric and also Lex. Uh, I was just kind of waiting to get a little bit harder data on this. But I absolutely have something in my... Uh, I basically discovered a way to look at the real situation here. Uh, I know I understand that I sound crazy. I get that. Um, but we're not talking about uh, collecting some uh, big events and understanding what they mean. We're talking about in real time, real experiences. And I have 28 verifications. It works 100% of the time. So uh, I can leave you my email. You can email me. I would say you don't. You only have your Twitter linked up. Uh, I have Twitter. I don't use it. But shoot me a message on Twitter and we'll we'll get in contact. You got it. Sorry about uh, hijacking the conversation, everybody. No, you're good, Danny. Shoot me a message. Uh, sure. I want to hear it. Um, interested indeed. Um, we'll keep it going, popcorn style, if you haven't yet had a chance to speak. Um, oh, yeah. So, uh, Mosa, you were next. And then, Heather, I saw you on mute. You can go up. Oh, okay. Uh, what I wanted to ask is, you were mentioning the red camera. My brother, who lives in Southampton, has two red cameras that are like movie cameras plus he has two 3d cameras that are about the size of the big iphone and i didn't believe him but when i went to the red convention with him there was a picture that they were showing of a pile of oranges and someone knocked the orange out and i automatically reached for it because i thought it was actually going to roll out of the camera but my question is is there any place out in the Southampton where they've had reports or Long Island where they've had reports of UFOs because he cannot travel now due to the uh, COVID and he's a traveling filmmaker. So I was wondering if there was anything that he could he set his cameras up in point in that area if there was something around the Long Island area. Heather, this is Christine. They are definitely in this area. I'm here in New York City and I see things over the sky. Uh, at twilight all the time here uh, in the middle of Manhattan. So there's certainly in Long Island as well. Heather, I'll, I'll reference something here in a second for you. Um, uh, it's just escaping my mind right now because uh, I have a million things running through it. Um, give me a second, I'll, I'll give you a, a place if he's nearby. Um, that was one of the biggest mass UFO sightings uh, in US history that, um, that took place uh, in, in New York. Um, and I'm just right now, I have it in my notes. I'm just blanking on the name. So let me get back to that. Um, and, and okay. I mean, right, Scotty, you got it. Um, well, I grew up on Long Island. <laughs> I'm, I'm no longer there, but I was there. Let's see, February of 2019, just before COVID. And, um, I saw something with my nephew. And I would also just say that they're everywhere. They're, they're everywhere all the time. Um, I, I think that uh, I'm going to post two, two, two clips to my uh, Instagram. I don't have a lot of stuff on my Instagram. I don't really um, use it for anything other than just clubhouse stuff. But um, I'm going to post uh, two, two things. One is a recent one here in Hawaii that uh, it was taken – by uh, a friend of a friend here that's on the island. Uh, that when and Nate, you brought up the TR-3B and it is a uh, kind of a relative of the TR-3B. And then also a swarm where uh, a person was just taking a time lapse with some palm trees in the foreground and uh, a swarm of them. And sometimes if you have a high quality camera, like a red, all you need to do is point it up to the sky. So if he is in Long Island, just uh, just have them pointed up to the, to the sky on a clear night. It, sometimes you need to do the time-lapse thing 
and you'll be surprised what you'll get. But uh, as recently as, you know, February 2019, it was, uh, was a sighting that I personally saw with my nephew on Long Island. So among many others while we were go- growing up. So I'll leave it there. I Thank second you. that. And Heather, it's Hudson Valley. Just have him look up the Hudson Valley incident. I'm not sure how far that is from you. Um, uh, that took far place. Away. That's where the military. Um, okay. Uh, well, Scott, what Scotty said is 100% true. If he has cameras that are that high powered and he just trains them at the sky, uh, especially if he has any type of coastal view, um, because in the gimbal, you know, the, the, one of those three and go fast actually both took place uh, off the Atlantic coast, uh, three of those first declassified videos. Um, so, uh, he's, if he's able to at least make a drive there and set up shop, uh, and has some memory cards to go, uh, and he, he trains at the sky and gets his aperture and everything all set up, um, and leaves it going. I am confident to say, uh, he will catch something. Um, I- yeah, I'm sure he even has the correct light filters for it because he was originally a, a lighting person. So um. perfect. Thank you, Heather. Uh, Mosen, sorry, uh, you're up. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for giving me time. Um, I think uh, I just wanted to add my two cents. Of, uh, it was a bit disappointing to lose Eric because he was uh, giving us uh, another point of view. Uh, to the subject. Uh, in terms of UFOs, um, uh, I have the opinion that, uh, I mean, UFOs are just on UFOs, uh, unidentified flying objects, and uh, to read too much into them, I mean, to take the leap from UFO sightings to the fact that you're not thinking when that something like extraterrestrial beings or aliens can exist or do exist or uh, to put out facts like they definitely are sure they exist is just too big of a leap, in my opinion. Uh, on the subject of the scientific community and the scientific method, uh, in my opinion, uh, we don't have any any other tool than the scientific method or the science or science to prove if, even if they do exist. I mean, statistically speaking. Uh, people in uh, statistics world believe that yes, uh, there are possibilities that other civilizations uh, can exist. But what tools do we have to look for them? I believe we don't have any other tools than the tools that science gives us. I think that uh, tools such as I don't know personal experiences or uh, things mentioned such as consciousness or the. Uh, a con- higher consciousness of uh, human beings, which I don't think is even proven, uh, can show this to us um, is a bit uh, strange, and I don't uh, agree with them. Um, and the fact of the matter is, uh, I don't have any examples of anything, any finding, any discoveries, anything that we, that mankind has made. Um, other than using uh, the scientific method or science, um, and uh, if, if if there is any, I'd like to hear them. I wouldn't mind hear them, hearing about them. Um, that was my two cents. This is Mostan, and uh, I'm done speaking. Thank you. Can I have a contrary view to that, uh, Nate, with your permission? Yeah, and then uh, we're gonna do a Haley do a quick room reset because we've passed the uh, hour two. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I I think it was uh, Christina who's who's Christine who's still here who brought up a pretty interesting uh, point about uh, germ theory. Uh, now now if you think about it, I think it was in the 15th century. I don't know if the the it was an Italian uh, scientist I think who went against what was then known as the miasma theory, which basically said that disease comes from bad air. Uh, and and uh, I'm I'm getting to the topic. Don't worry about it. It just needs to needs this to illustrate the point. Uh, so for about 400 years after that, we did not uh, have basically the miasma theory was a competing theory to the germ theory, and most people thought it was the miasma theory that should be believed. And eventually, 
there was more and more evidence piling up into the scientific community for the germ theory. And eventually we got to the microscope when we could actually start seeing these germs. Uh, so the reason I mentioned that, and I'm not, uh, I'm not saying either way, I'm just uh, saying I have an open mind. I don't know, I haven't had these experiences, fortunately or unfortunately. And uh, I, I don't know, but what I'm saying is I think the, the least that this event can do for us uh, is the fact that just like the completely deep, it was sort of specific establishment uh, back in the 15th, 16th, 17th, maybe even 18th and 19th century until the germ theory started being used. It's possible that the scientific community still doesn't have uh, the devices and the tools to sort of measure the, the activity that we're talking about, whether it's consciousness or UAPs. And that's the reason I have an open mind. I'm not looking at it either way yet. Uh, and uh, the, the fact that I think I disagree with Eric to the extent that I don't think we're going to have a Jan 6th uh, sort of reconciliation of narratives because I think the report's going to just be more of the same, unfortunately, but I'm hoping it's not. Uh, but what I do take optimism from is uh, that Nate, what, what you're doing here and what Eric is also doing, it, it gives me optimism that both sides are engaging now and the stigma is going away. Because for a long time, like Eric said, it was a very important point. If you were a PhD in physics and you were in, sort of interested in this uh, sort of phenomenon and wanted to bring the scientific lens on it. And if you were caught uh, with your pants down in a theory that was uh, complete, uh, you know, not not grounded in science, you would basically lose your entire reputation, your, your career, and you'd never be remembered as a scientist again. So it, it's important that this data actually comes out. I'm hoping whatever the government's trying to do, uh, keeping the data away from us, like Eric says, backfires because now there's more conversation, there's destigmatization, both sides are talking to each other, which I find very optimistic. And I'm hoping then they will be forced to st start sharing some of this information. And we then know either way, uh, whichever way the science, science basically gives us the proof of. So that's me, I'm Sharath, I'm done talking. Sharath, this is Christine. Um, I just want to quickly respond to what you said there. Please make it quick, Christine, we want to reset the room. No, Christine finished. I just said, please make it quick. So oh, so, so sorry. Um, anyway, I just, I think it's interesting because it loops back actually even to what Eric was saying. And I've seen some of his posts on Twitter about uh, his his criticism of if this information is, you know, it's hard to believe that the government would keep this sort of thing from us type of thinking. And that, you know, the where are the experts, where are the scientists? And he, he, you know, earlier was making the comments of like, I want my information. Like this isn't for a government or uh, you know, any group to withhold that this belongs to everyone, right? But I think it actually loops back around that those, the, the criticism of where the scientists and the experts commenting on these things is kind of exactly that point. If you, in the past, and I don't think it's all that different now, um, and it's certainly the case in science and still with medicine also, and that if you try to approach talking about something where you do not have hard factual data, and if you get caught, as you just said, use the terminology with your pants down or losing your shirt, you know, some of those old adages around uh, exposing yourself to being in, in, engaged with that information without something that is really, really grounded in base facts, then you were sacrificing uh, the entirety of your career. So my, my point is, I think that that's sort of like self, um, self-referential in terms of it, it, <laughs> it kind of answers the question of that criticism is where are those experts? Well, those experts wouldn't be in the position for exactly that, uh, that behavioral practice that's been on in society. And with that stigma, they wouldn't be sticking their neck out, so to speak, because we probably don't have both access to um, whatever technology we would need to synthesize that stuff in a more uh, readable form, and also the risk factor for the individual experts. Just, uh, hey, Nate, just hey, real quick, I, I got to get off. Uh, I try, It won't allow me to text you on Twitter. I texted you on Instagram, so hopefully okay. that's your account. Okay, yeah, if you hit me on Instagram, that's sure. where I'm at. So, yeah, I'll, cool. I'll check. Well, hold on before you leave. Uh, Haley, um, 
Uh, Danny, yeah, I see I've, you. I got you. I've got you. Okay. Okay. Thank this you. This is Haley speaking with a quicker top of the hour room reset. Welcome to Nate Night Talks, UFO and government disclosure, a week in review. This is our weekly Monday night room where we highlight news and disclosure articles that have dropped in the past week around the world pertaining to UFOs and phenomena. We're focusing on a healthy dialogue and debate on a number of op-eds and articles released this week including the Washington Post and New York Times on the impending UAP report to be released. We've been discussing the historical narratives of UFOs and the why around the timing of current disclosure. As always, dissecting this through the lens of varied perspectives. We have an amazing group of well-researched moderators, Silva, Dada, Robbie, Joe, Kat, Scotty, and of course, Nate. This is Nate's club. He runs this club with purpose and intention to share his deep knowledge and research as it pertains to phenomena, UFOs, and so much more that you can go read in his bio. So I do recommend you follow the Nate Night Talks Club and my co-mods if you're enjoying the discussion here. It's the easiest way to be notified when rooms begin on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. We've been joined on stage by some wonderful speakers. Eric Weinstein has been with us tonight, raising some great questions around crossing bridges with the scientific community who have found an interest, suspending some prior skepticism and how we can move those dialogues forward. While we do have many speakers and moderators on stage who are deeply versed in consciousness and connectivity to the subject matter, we will try and save those discussions for other nights and please stay on topic to engage our wider NNT community on Monday Night Reviews. We also thank everyone in the audience for being here. We really appreciate you. We are an open space for people to share their research, their experiences, and for people like myself to ask questions and learn. So as long as we remain open-minded, inquisitive, and above all respectful, you're all welcome on this stage, but please keep your shares and questions short to a minute or two, and please stay on topic again. If you do attempt to derail the conversation or are disrespectful, you will be removed from the stage quickly. We have a zero tolerance policy for that here. So with love, this is Haley with the curls done speaking over to you, Nate, or one of our mods. God damn, Haley, I almost had a point there. I felt like I was sitting in an airplane getting like the, uh, the, the safety breakdown from one of the <laughs> flight attendants. Um, you know, uh, Haley, actually, I think it's a good way to uh, segue into this. Uh, I guess we're past the second half point of the room. Um, I know you had uh, some questions, and the, the beauty of uh, the lovely Haley here is that she, I think, represents the largest demographic of people um, who are new to this subject. Uh, she is an inquiring mind, um, has not spent a lot of time researching this at all, but she holds space and gives the best damn room reset uh, on Clubhouse. Um, but but she's here to kind of be a voice for people who might be new uh, to the subject and ask kind of questions that, um, you know, I think most people who are new to it are pondering as we have a tendency to be able to go very deep uh, into conversations as it pertains to consciousness and the history of the phenomena and uh, the government's involvement and declassified documents and a whole plethora of other things. And so that being said, uh, Haley, I know you did have a a couple questions and I feel like they're a good way to kind of springboard us back on track and so if you want to throw those out as the, um, the starting point for uh, this next phase, then uh, I, would, I would love that. This is Haley speaking. Sure, I can do that. Um, I had two or three questions, so I'm not really sure where to start. But I guess the first is fairly baseline. Um, and it was just that with so much distrust of the government, or if you distrust the institution, how or why do you trust the validity of the videos themselves or the confirmation by the DOD that they were taken by Navy personnel? Has there been any discussion around this at all within or outside of the UFO community? Um, that was the first question, and I'm not sure if you want me to continue with the others and then you can address them all or if you want to jump straight into that one, Nate. Well, I, I mean, that's... Uh... That's actually a good, I mean, I think a good jumping off point. And I think uh, some people who have been very uh, disenchanted with uh, with our government as of late uh, with fake news and everything that has transpired over the past, I don't know, eight years, but more particularly the past four, um, 
this divide that's taken place. This uh, there's no such thing as you know free press anymore. They're very much owned. We know that. We know who owns them. We know who they're the mouthpiece for. Uh, and it's very clear that nothing is being reported as news, but rather as uh, an agenda. And that has been very uh, concerning to uh, a lot of people, and I think has created a level of, of apathy within the masses of just not knowing uh, where to go to get valid information anymore that is not biased, um, that is not uh, <laughs> ridden with the uh, agenda, but uh, it's it's also just a point of you, just, you don't trust anybody. And I think there's a number of people who are at that stage. And so if you take that as the, the pretense uh, to the, the question, and then you look at, you know, what's happening now, it's like, well, how can you believe any of it? How do you know that, you know, this, uh, any of this is, is real? Uh, how can you, you know, even trust what they're saying uh, to begin with, uh, that the release of any of this stuff is valid? Um, and it's a very good question. Um, and it, it's, it basically stems from the idea that uh, the government doesn't do anything by accident. Uh, as much as a lot of people like to think that they're uh, incompetent, and they are at, at so many levels, but when it comes to secrecy, when it comes to intelligence, uh, they, they are very, very well-versed and have proven that uh, with the UFO phenomenon itself. Uh, they're, ever since the Robertson panel, they have successfully shifted the mass consciousness of this country to a point that we're now in a phase of trying to reverse it, to reverse the stigma and the disinformation that's taken place. Um, and that is being met with such resistance. And that's why I think you have even, you know, the, the conversations that have been taking place in this app and a lot of people in the scientific community, there is still so much of that ingrained that the, the deprogramming of all that is going to take a while, but how do we trust any of it? Well, I mean, we can't really trust, you know, anything to a degree, but I, I do trust that the the footage and everything is is very real and very valid, as are the you know the the pilots and whatnot who are encountering these things and the radar technicians. Uh, that's not necessarily, I think, what's up for debate. It is the fact that it is being put out now in the narrative in which they are wrapping around this information and the timing at which it is being brought out. That, I think, is where the, the questioning takes place um, because this was, you know, supposedly done by whistleblowers. This was all started from Tom, Tom DeLong's to the Stars Academy of Arts and Science. He was one that recruited Lou Elizondo and Christopher Mellon and Steve Justice at Lockheed Skunk Works and a number of other people. Um, it is all because of that uh, company and that, you know, initiative that uh, this, this group was put together in the first place that, you know, inevitably got these videos released through ATIP and the DOD. And so we know that that information came out in that form and in that capacity. But the, the, the cause for skepticism, the cause that requires our discernment uh, and you know, intellectual capacities uh, is, is the what's being said and the why. Um, and it, this is the problem, though, is that there is so much distrust for the government, and rightfully so. Like this, they, they earn this. It is, I've given the analogy of being in a relationship with somebody who cheats on you all the time. You know they're cheating on you. I mean, you're, you're finding you know, other people's underwear in your bed, and they're still denying it. You know it's happening. Like It's like, no, you've already been found out. It's here. Just own up to it. And they're like, nope, nope. No, I didn't do it. <laughs> no, that's somebody else's. That was a friend. It's like, well, you know you're blatantly being lied to. And you can only be lied to so much where there's just all trust is lost. And, you know, sadly, this is a relationship that doesn't seem like we're able to get out of um, uh, as, as it pertains to the government. And so people are in this constant state of, of distrust. And it's, it's through the government's own fault. And instead, they're never going to admit they're wrong. Uh, we talked about that at the beginning of the room. That's the last thing the government ever does is admit fault. They will not do it. They will cause wars in other countries just to avoid admitting that they were wrong. Uh, weapons of mass destruction, i.e. This, this, is, this is their MO. And so, no, I don't think uh, that these videos are uh, fake and that we can't trust the validity of what is coming out. But we definitely need to be very cautious and skeptical of the validity of the narrative that is surrounding it, as well as the timing of everything. Um, but then again, I could be wrong. It, this all could be a giant psyop. I would not put it beyond the government. Um, and, and to what end, you know, that would be another room conversation in and of itself. But I think that's a, a good jumping off point that is a little more on track with uh, the topic of what's been going on the past seven days. 
So with that being said, I do want to open it up to anyone uh, on the, in the audience who has not yet had a chance to speak. Please flash your mic. Uh, Stanley, I saw you flash first. You're up. Oh, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> I've been involved in uh, both as an anomaly researcher and just an interested citizen in the subject matter since I was a very young kid. And very recently, a, a writing came out, a book called Dark Fleet, The Secret Nazi Space Program and the Battle for the Solar System by Lynn Caston. Lynn has a long history in the UFO community as a researcher. And his I think his first book was Alien World Order. And he's been digging. He, he, the, the, he caught my attention because we had the same question. I've seen so much proof that the project uh, paperclip that came about at the end of World War II when over 8,000 Nazis were brought into the United States and infiltrated into the Pentagon, the space program of NASA, et cetera, in order that we could continue this research that's going on. And <clears throat> what he's been saying for, is that it's a political reality as a consequence of the Nazis' encounter of the draconian extraterrestrial group who gave them the uh, Foo Fighters or bell-shaped flying saucers. And that the whole thing right now is that there is, according to him in this book, and he's, it's well-researched and you know you certainly can Google your way through it and, and probably come to the same conclusion. His reality is that there's a, a coalition between the the existing Nazi Party and the uh, American government through various aspects, very, through various aspects of the. Um, uh, no, I don't. I don't. Let me finish this out. Uh, and that I, I want I say that I want to re recommend the book to you. Um, it's called, as I stated, uh, Dark Fleet Secret Nazi Space Program. But he gives a political reason for why they're doing what they're doing right now and how they're doing it and what the total intention is. So anyone I would recommend you take a glance at that. Thank you. Thank you, Stanley. Uh, Scotty, I know you had something that you wanted to uh, chime into Haley's initial uh, question. Yes. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to quickly comment on or uh, <clears throat> answer to uh, Haley's question, which is, you know, it's a really good one. If um, if you just Google the uh, actually, I'm going to I'm going to link it in the photo that I just posted of a TR3B in Hawaii on my Instagram. But in the uh, in the 80s, there was this thing called the church, the church committee hearings. And um, essentially what they found is that the CIA is uh, actively involved in embedding stories into the U.S. media. This is not a conspiracy theory. These were real hearings that happened in the Senate. And you can hear the question from a, from a, a senator asking pointedly, is the CIA involved in embedding stories into the U.S. media? And the answer was, from the CIA, this is something we should discuss in executive session. And what that exec executive session, for those of you that don't live in the United States or know what that means, it essentially means it's something we need to discuss in private. If the answer was no, it would have just been no. So uh, regarding the media, that, that's very telling. And then regarding the New York Times piece and, and the rest of the media in general, the New York Times is the same publication that everybody used to trust and many still do as the gold standard in news. But it's the same publication that fired Pulitzer Prize winning uh, journalist Chris Hedges for telling the truth about the war in Iraq before the truth in Iraq actually ever got out. So he told the truth. He was fired. And then, you know, years later, Bush comes out and apologizes. Oh, yeah, you know, sorry, we got bad intel. So 
how can we trust the New York Times with anything? So the question that Haley asks is, it's really important. And I think that's part of the tactic here is to cause confusion. Who do we trust? We trust the New York Times. We don't trust the New York Times. Does anyone trust the CIA because of what they've done in the past? People have short memories. Part of it is definitely much a psyop, as Nate said. Um, and then within that, there's threads of truth. But again, as Nate said, the timing of all this, I asked um, a prominent member of the UFO community uh, a few a few weeks ago in another room, uh, Linda Moulton Howe, you know, why now when the, the consciousness of the planet uh, is, at a, is at a low regarding the, the morale of the planet? Sorry. You know, why, why do this now? And that's the question we all have to ask. Like, why are they doing this? There's plenty of other shit going on. People are worried about COVID. So the whole thing just stinks to high hell. <laughs> so the best thing to do is to use discernment. And, uh, and that's one of the reasons why Nate is here and why I'm here and the rest of us are here is because we like to talk about these things in, uh, in a real valid discerning way. So uh, thanks for the great question, Haley. And I don't know if Robbie may have had a, a question following up to what uh, Haley brought up. This is Scotty, I'm done. Thank you, Scotty. Haley, I don't know if you wanted to respond to that first. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for the great answer, Scotty. I appreciate it and over to you, Robbie. Thank you, thank you so much. I actually love the question that Haley proposed because I think it's one that can't be ignored when we present this duly composed discussion surrounding what is clearly now confirmed unknown aerial phenomenon alongside the conversation of this past, present, current political agenda. So I think regarding the mistrust of the government, uh, which I'll kind of recap what she was kind of asking, was that how can we now trust this government when we are really talking about this mistrust of government of with them having concealed all this information from us and how can we now trust that the information that is being conveyed which is very much their very own videos you know the naval videos uh how do we trust that that is even true so it's it's a great question in that regard and i think for those that are really new to this conversation i think it's really a way of presenting it in this form and i and i love the answers and the confirmation uh, that Scotty was giving as well, uh, alluding to the Washington Post or whatnot. But instead of looking at it as a way that we're asking you to now trust the government, I, I would look at it as, as a more to trust the people. And I say that in this regard. So when we're looking at the history of this phenomenon, right, there, it's not just this, these videos that are now being, um, you know, exposed and shown from, oh, look, it was the Naval Academy releasing this or the Army or whatnot. Those videos are coming into the media spotlight because those who are presenting it are within the military and those who are within the military work for the government. So it is a little bit more, I guess, when we're looking at who we're getting the information from, I think that's a first level step where we can likely trust those who are within the government to be exposing the government first. It's like a first round, but these videos have been there. These videos are no different than any other videos that have been taken from the general public who may not be in the military, whose voice mostly made them sound like kooks, who would have 100% not been believed, who have for 70 years not been believed. So these videos are very parallel to the videos that are now being released into the media spotlight. And if you actually look at them, there'll be 10 videos of the same exact thing. We look at the Phoenix Lights, for example. I mean, there was hundreds of people that took the same exact video. It just wasn't the military that exposed it. So this is only one of thousands. And in fact, there are other videos that showcase something that looks a little bit more real, something that might be even more awe-inspiring, that might be even closer visually, but they don't have a credible source around them, which is the inside workings of the government finally risking their own careers, their own reputations to release what is quite possibly government video. Um, so I, I say instead of trusting the government, trust your people. This information has been here for 70 years. It's only now that we can actually look back in time and think, huh, these people weren't really kooks because we are now destigmatizing the entire message surrounding this aerial phenomenon. 
And I think that's the way that I would answer that, Haley. I love that question. I, I really like the way that it was proposed. This is Robbie, and I'm done speaking for now. And really quick, just to build on what Scotty and Robbie both just said, um, uh, Scotty brought up something that is incredibly true that people really need to come to terms with as it pertains to, <laughs> to how the media works, how the government works, and how our intelligence agencies work, um, and how embedded they are uh, within the media itself. And you have, in addition to what he was referencing, um, uh, you have people like Richard Doty, who came forward, who, you know, once again, people in the ufology can, you know, we have we have feelings about him. Um, but uh, he was an intelligence officer with the CIA and a counterintelligence officer with the CIA, I should say, and uh, is was solely tasked with uh, basically infiltrating the UFO community and uh, sowing uh, dissent and disinformation within the community um, and uh, led to the suicide of, of one person in particular and uh, a number of other things. And he's come forward talking about the government, uh, they faked abductions themselves, um, that they there was uh, at least 100 people that he knew who were CIA and embedded in the media who he paid off, like, uh, or he had them, you know, basically pay off the media that like, uh, this was an ongoing thing. He just laughed. He's like, yeah, of course, this is what's happening. Of course, this is what's been going on. Like they filter all stories. Every story that comes out uh, is is essentially approved by them if it pertains into any type of intelligence or sensitive information uh, within uh, the government or the intelligence agencies in specific. And this has been the MO, uh, you know, forever. And so it's it's only newer information to us now. But this is a part of it, and this is how it works. And it, it, what Robbie said is very important. <laughs> to that and think that every single thing you read in the news is real. And then I, I would implore you to, to, to watch the whole thing, including the end where the president of CBS News is asked a similar question. And he basically just says, oh, yeah, you know, they, they, they you know, they people do work in the CIA work for the news. So uh, it's in the it's in the my Instagram under that my latest post. So I, I'll I'll leave it there. And um, the, the last thing I want to say is that again, in, in this room specifically, you know I, I I'm here to hold the integrity of this subject. And there's a lot of conspiracy theories of what people call conspiracy theories, and think that that term comes along with a tinfoil hat. And what we're trying to do here is present these topics in a respectable way and back it up with truth. That's why Data is here, who's one of the top hackers in the world. And that's why Joe Cat is here. And that's, you know, Silver and Nate, I know, have been, have been exploring this subject for a long period of time. And we're not here, you know, sometimes we speculate, um, but, uh, you know, here we're here to take this topic really seriously and help people weed out the bullshit from what is fact. And the fact of the matter is that the CIA is absolutely involved in disinformation within the U.S. media. And, and the proof is out there. And uh, I posted that link today. So um, watch. Don't leave the room now, but uh, watch it when you when you can. It's not that long. And I guarantee you, your view on the U.S. media will forever be changed because these programs do not stop once they start them. So it's still going on today at a fever pitch. Uh, this is Scotty and I'm done. 
Thank you, Scotty. I do want to open it up now, popcorn style, to people on the stage who have yet to have a chance to speak. So, uh, Baba, I think you spoke first. Was that you? Uh -huh. Actually, I was. Or Robert. Uh, uh, Robert. Yeah. Okay. I was just going to uh, ask something that, that doesn't seem to be coming up a whole lot is that this is this has been um, these particular you know gimbal and tic tac and the they've made the media circuit numerous times since I guess it was 2017. Was that right? Um, and you know, it's funny that it's only just now finally gotten to this point where there's going to be this report because it's it, it's been these these same events and these these same people have the, the information has been available for a long time. But the uh, there's was one article where in Popular Mechanics it's called Inside the Pentagon's Secret UFO Program where they really do an extreme deep dive into how all this information was released, the specific individuals involved, and unfortunately it's behind a paywall now. But when, when I first read it, it was it was not. <laughs> If any of you have actually gone through uh, that particular article because it was really, really good when it came down to getting to this very, very specific information of who said what and how each you know piece of this information was released and why. And, uh, I think it's a it's a great grounding for a, you know something that's kind of a he said she said thing when you when you only cover it topically and and you know here they're they're really talking about specific names and people and dates and of of when and what information was passed on to who and there's you know questions about bigelow aerospace for instance is is one of my favorite topics there i just happened to watch the episode of, of stargate sg1 last night where they had a they purposely had this this thing called colson industries that was supposed to be an analog for Big, bigelow aerospace and so it's you know it's just it's kind of funny but they they, they talk about all of that i'm just curious if any of you guys have uh, have read that particular article i read the article a while ago um uh, yes uh hard to it, it was actually uh, from my memory um a actually pretty solid article um but it's been a while uh so for me to quote from it given the amount of articles uh i've been reading um over the past uh, month or so um, it might be a, a little, a little tough, but I, I do, I do recall it. I, I recommend for people who don't, uh, I have my Google alerts. I've had this set up for probably 10 years now in my Gmail, uh, to send me a, a notification anytime the, the word UFO or extraterrestrial was mentioned among other things within, you know, specific things within the subject matter that I was interested in. Um, and so every, every day I get an email, uh, that contains, um, you know, every reference of those words, whatever the article, whatever the website, uh, is. And so if you're really wanting to stay abreast to everything going on, um, you can set your Google alerts and your Gmail to do that so that you will instantly get, uh, an email at the end of every night, usually around 11 o'clock that has every, every website, um, uh, that mentioned, um, the, whichever you want, whatever you want to search for. I mean, it could be anything else, but specifically the UFOs or extraterrestrials are now UAP. Um, uh, you can throw in there as well. But uh, but good good reference, um, Robert. It might actually be worth going back and uh, giving it another uh, another read um, because the few that actually are out there that are are decent are hard to kind of come by. Um, so. Uh, yeah, appreciate it, man. If there was anything, you know, super uh, off the top of your head that you thought was compelling as it pertains to the, the subject of tonight's room, um, definitely, you know, you can feel free to brief, briefly mention it uh, for the, the betterment of all if there's something that came to mind. I'm afraid I just have to refer to that that specific uh, article because it, it was just one that, you know, I'll go back for. I'm about to probably pay for access again because I want to go back over the specific individuals because it really gets into their relationships and and uh, I thought it was very compelling at the time. And now I, I can't remember the details of it. Uh, I just remember that it was more specific than any other article that I that I'd read yet so far. So, and, and it's still that's that's still true today. I haven't run into a good, you know, concise uh, record of how the information moved and was released because that's kind of what we're talking about here. Is you know why now? You know, and and looking at it from this perspective of it started in, in around 2017, I guess was when it was first released, and it's been it's been released to the public multiple times. In other words, it's 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 popped up in the the public eye. Yeah, I think this is at least the third time, and then now is when they're actually going forward, and that's that's interesting to me that that that's what's happening. And you've just said the bane of my existence is not being able to recall. If I could only recall uh, on notice all of the books, all of the research, all of the things over the past 12 years, uh, it would be absolutely amazing. There's just there's so much of it out there that 
you end up just having to put together the broad the broad strokes and the the key points and the most solid things to kind of uh, you know paint the best picture. But yeah, uh, who was a uh, so uh, Baba? I think you were next. Uh, flashing your mic, and then we'll we'll keep it going uh, after that. Just flash your mics if you want to talk. Hi, Nate. Uh, good morning from sunny Germany. I know it's good evening or oh, early morning for you. Can I just ask uh, on the top of the room? I know this is the review of the week. Uh, I noticed there were some rooms um, at the weekend on the New York Times article. And there was a deep discussion that happened well, Sunday morning, my time, but it would have been late Saturday night for you guys. Can I just ask for a summary of that article and a summary of that discussion? I know Scotty was in on that discussion because I heard him speak or at said points. The discussion ran for hours and hours, maybe even 24 hours. And there it was, was it was three days. It was three days, Baba. That room went three days. Okay. Well, I was in Switzerland for three days, so <laughs> sorry I missed that. Uh, can I just ask for a summary of that? Because there were some scientists in there as well. There were some physicists in there. and I, I mean, I am a physicist, so I come from that background. Uh, and I'd love to sort of just get a summary from somebody. And if there are people in the room who weren't there, maybe that would help them as well. Thanks. This is Baba. Well, I mean, the summary of the article, I mean, in brief, if we're talking just the real key takeaways from it, was really just the first... Uh, I guess, a leak um, from a uh, Pentagon insider uh, who has read the report that's going to be coming out um, on the, I think the 25th is what they're saying. We'll see if that happens. Um, and basically, you know, stated that there was going to be 120 cases in there, which I also, we haven't even talked about how preposterous that is over a course of nearly two decades. Um, but they, it seems to be the cases strictly from ATIP, which also goes to show that this mandate that was put out, uh, which all of us uh, feared or speculated would be the case uh, in, in January when this was put in the, the COVID bill, um, that the intelligence agencies weren't going to give any of this up. And so it seems that the, the 120 cases are coming strictly from ATIP, uh, the program that literally had $22 million funding in a defense budget that is in the trillions. Um, so uh, that was basically it. And then, you know, drawing, uh, you know, the, the conclusion uh, or stating basically the same thing that, uh, you know, we we don't really know what this is. Uh, there's, there's no evidence of alien technology, but we also can't rule it out either. And so it's basically been the, the limbo of that. But the biggest the biggest takeaway, you know, from it was uh, the the fact that there, you know, we know we know what's going to be in the report, uh, not the conclusions they're going to be drawing per se, uh, although I think they're alluding to it with that. But uh, there's 120 um, 120 cases that are going to be revealed, um, and they also made it seem like uh, some of those weren't also from our government, which then adds to the whole thing of like jesus okay so not only do we have an, uh, far more than that i assure you but uh we're we're now cherry picking other instances from like mexico and south america because they're obviously going to be referring to i think some of the ones that were recently released i think by corbell um of the ones that the uaps or the usos that uh, ultimately went under the water um and, uh, and and things like that. So it's not even coming from our government. So these things weren't even classified to begin with. It's just going to be, it seems like they're now adding other videos from other places, which really shows that like, uh, they're not divulging anything. If they're, if they're going out to get other, you know, uh, videos from other countries that, you know, anybody could have had access to if they, you know, uh, use DuckDuckGo or something, um, could have, could have found these things. But that was basically the, the, the summary of the, the article itself. And then there were probably 50 million different uh, conversations. <laughs> I'm exaggerating, but it seemed like that uh, that took place. And those of you who know me on this app, I'm never on here outside of the Nate Night Talks rooms and, uh, and and Robbie's rooms and one other room that I co-modded. And so I popped into that just because uh, I was pained mercilessly and engaged in a lot of uh, ongoing debate with a number of uh you know scientists and skeptics and physicists and whatnot and so i think i was on there for you know seven hours at one point i know scotty scotty and robbie were on there for a long time as well so it's it'd be really hard to summarize the conversations because there were so 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 many that went down so many different paths but that's the article scotty robbie if there's something that you know uh really stood out to you as far as a key takeaway from all of the, the debate that took place in that three-day room 
um, feel free to throw it in there. But that's that's all I got. You know, the the one thing I'll say is, uh, which was already brought up in this room, um, someone asked a question much earlier about evidence and, you know, hard evidence. And there were talks about sensors that we can't trust sensors because they're computers, but that is also backed up by highly trained pilots that fly billion dollar war machines that definitely know what they're looking at. There, there, there was, there was a lot of, a lot of uh, really intelligent people asking really newbie beginner questions that could be answered away very easily. Uh, so the, the, the thing that got me the most is that when we look at this question of evidence and, and that, that topic was discussed, got discussed for quite a while. And there were a few attorneys in there. And one of them said, we have convicted people for on murder for decades and decades on way less evidence than what has been put forth over the years, over the 60 years regarding UFO evidence. When we go to talk to eyewitnesses, collection of data, collection of uh, videos, pictures, things like that, eyewitness reports, uh, in, you know, experiencers, things like that. So that, that's just a good point to remember. Um, so that's all I'll say on that. I just want to make a really quick public service announcement since there's a lot of, there's a lot of new people in the room with party hats that are new to clubhouse and many of you have raised their hand. So just a word of, you know, kind of user wisdom in here. If you don't have anything put on your profile, you have a blank bio, there's a lot of rooms that won't invite you up to the stage, even if you have your your hand raised. And the reason for that is there are some bots that troll around Clubhouse and there's also trolls that troll around Clubhouse. So we would love for the new faces to come up here and have you introduce yourself and ask the really intelligent questions. But before we do that, please make sure that you do have something a little bit on your bio. It doesn't have to be anything super personal. It could just be, Hey, I'm here to learn you know, whatever, just something. So we know that you're not an AI bot or, or just a troll. And that's all I'll say. This is Scotty. I'm done. Oh, I have to add to that. Cause right after Scotty said that I, or right before he said it, I turned off hand raising just cause uh, we're, we're going to be wrapping up in about an hour and I want to make sure we get to uh, everybody who's on stage who hasn't spoke um, but yes, uh, what Scotty said is true. That is how this club uh, and many others operate. That if you uh, are new, you have a party hat, you have nothing in your bio, and you don't have social media linked, you will not be brought up. Um, so you must have something in your bio. You must have social media linked in order to be brought up. We do want to hear from you, of course, but that is the prerequisite to being up because uh, trolling happens all the time. And well, it is a minor inconvenience. It is quite annoying to have somebody come up and just start cursing uh, and, you know, talking shit to people for even if it's for a brief second. It derails the conversation enough that uh, it's uh, we found effective ways to filter it out. And we know how to preview profiles very efficiently now and see who these people are um, because they're usually signed on within a day. And uh, the person who invited them was within a day and that person was within a day. Or sometimes they don't have any person that referred them, which also shows you that uh, they are definitely a bot. So we're, we're well versed at uh, pinpointing those things. But we also know that a lot of you are just, in fact, new, especially with the uh, release for Android. So uh, we do want to have you up here. We do want to hear uh, everybody's thoughts. Um, so, uh, new or not, that doesn't matter, but just make sure you have your social media linked because we do check to make sure you are real, uh, and do have something in your bio, um, and a profile picture, obviously, um, uh, that, uh, that kind of goes without saying, but, uh, make sure those three things are done so that we can, uh, we can bring you up here and, uh, and get you involved in the conversation, uh, next time, I guess. But, um, uh, Rohit, uh, Rohit, if I'm saying that right. Yes, uh, Nate, you're saying that right. So. Um, I'm just going to quickly, uh, I want to talk to Timur Kuran's theory of preference falsification and how to fight that, right? So who are we going to look to to debunk or deconstruct these observations and data? If not the uh, institutions, then should we be looking at the heretics and the individualists, let's say from the scientific community? And we know that uh, there aren't too many around, right? So basically a preference, uh, so preference falsification is a preference that differs from one's true preference. 
And uh, the scientific community frequently conveys, especially to media or researchers or pollsters, preferences that are di that differ from what they truly want, right? Often because they believe the conveyed preference is more acceptable socially. So platforms such as yours are doing a really great job. But is there a bigger project that we can undertake collectively to ensure that there's no self-censorship on these topics from, you know, from the leaders? That question's for you. Uh, I, I, I extrapolate a little bit more please this needs some clarification on what you're asking sure uh, what i mean is um a lot of people uh, a lot of people believe something uh, in private but when it comes to uh, a public preference there's usually self-censoring so is there something that we can do apart from these conversations and encouraging these kind of conversations that we can do to to, to kind of change that is what I hope I hope I was clear with that. Yeah, no, okay, I, I understood. I just uh, need a little more clarification. Yeah, I mean, that's that is really the the Monday night rooms in particular are, are really geared towards that. And, uh, and this is the second Monday that uh, in a row that Eric came in and, and spoke on. Um, and he was in a number before I think before he kind of, you know, snipped it out and made sure that it was a it was a type of stage that he'd be willing to get on. And so uh, we tried to be very, very vigilant and sober-minded about this reality and uh, and and how the scientific community views this, what they ultimately have at stake, because it is career suicide. Though that stigma is somewhat decreasing, uh, it, it's really hasn't. Um, I mean, if if anybody came up and you know really suddenly said what they thought and they were a highly respected, you know, physicist or uh, you know scientist in, in any capacity. And then something came out within the media that like, oh, no, like actually uh, this ended up being a, a psyop and none of this was real. Like they we'd go right back to the, the the stigmatization that was there before and those people would be ostracized. So it's trying to create an environment uh, for one, which is hard because we want to bring people on stage uh, to have them engage in conversation. But everybody comes from a different perspective and a different walk of life. And some of them may be uh, more out there or more deep down the rabbit hole than any of these scientists are uh, or academics are willing to go. And so you have to try and create a safe space. And so I've been trying to facilitate this conversation with uh, Eric Weinstein and Dr. Greer, and I'm just waiting. Greer's on, on board for it. Uh, just waiting to hear back from uh, from Eric and see if he's on board for it. But that conversation, no one's going to be allowed on stage. Uh, it's going to be a, a closed conversation that is for them because, uh, and hopefully Danny Sheehan will uh, join in on that as well, because you have to create the safe space where uh, they can have this conversation. They can keep it uh, at a level without it you know, being derailed uh, or a trigger that comes up that is, and a lot of these scientists have it, and Eric, Eric even voiced it, like, you know, the consciousness thing is a big trigger um, uh, to the scientific community, and people, they immediately turn off. And so it's kind of like baby-stepping the scientific community into this subject matter uh, and, and doing so in a very spoon-fed kind of way. Uh, that's not going to, uh, you know, trigger them or turn them off immediately. And so... The, the Monday night rooms are geared towards that of basically just kind of dissecting a narrative of the past, you know, week as it pertains to the disclosure movement, but also giving people uh, the backdrop of the past 80 years um, and, you know, having meaningful dialogue about, you know, the why now, what, what could this mean? What do we think, you know, is the motive behind it? Uh, you know, what do we think they actually are? Do we think they're aliens? You know, getting all people's perspective in this because they're all valuable, like, moderators obviously come from one uh one stance with it and it's clear but we we are open to hearing everything else we want to hear because if anything is presented with uh you know with i guess conviction and uh, and research um and is a valid point then it's it's taken and it should be and we any of us who think that we have the answers um you know are are instantly in the dark already because nobody has all the answers we're just trying to figure them out and have done a lot of research into that and think we might have some answers about certain things, but it's a lot of it's still speculation. And so I guess that I don't know what else can be done um, other than trying to create a safe space and, uh, you know, a closed stage to a degree where you're going to have a few, you know, uh, thought leaders from counter perspectives up, you know, debating um, but that's also, you know, the hard thing is clubhouses. The whole point of it is it's a social platform 
where everybody, you know, has an opportunity to share their viewpoint and engage. And, you know, that's obviously why we're all here and what we want. And so it's, it's difficult because, uh, unless they're coming in with an open mind and we can't control that, like, uh, then, and be, if they're, unless they're willing to hear everything and be willing to be, even if they don't agree with it or they think it's, it's nonsense, still being willing to hear it and not being so turned off by a counter perspective that they, you know, think is nonsense or have never looked into. Um, it's going to be hard outside of, I think, doing any more than we're doing now, which is trying to keep the topic very specific uh, other rooms, we're going to go in different directions that are going to be down rabbit holes, and we're going to specify that beforehand. So the title will be that, and people don't have to come in if they're not willing to go down that rabbit hole with us and really dive deep. But uh, outside of that, I don't know. I've been trying to, you know, me and uh, the mods have been trying to rack our brain to think of what else could possibly you know, uh, be done to instill a level of, of confidence to get uh, people from the scientific community or academia who um, are a little more trepidatious towards this to uh, come up and engage in it. And so it's just being very specific with the topic, trying to keep control of that topic and that narrative so that it doesn't get derailed and, uh, and hoping that, you know, they, they're willing to open up and engage in that. But it's, it's not up to us at the end of the day. It's up to the individual uh, as it is with anything. But uh, so far, that's, that's what we got. And, uh, and, you know, being uniform with our, our little profile pictures and trying to, you know, seem as organized and responsible as, as humanly possible to the subject. So it, it just doesn't look like something that's chaotic and, and all over the place, that it's a, a meaningful, specific, targeted conversation. And outside of that, you know, a closed, a closed stage is really the only other thing that I think is going to draw in some who are really, uh, you know, more nervous about this or afraid to kind of open up. But I'm also always open to suggestions if there's something I haven't thought of. Um, but that is, that's it so far, Rohit. So hopefully that answers the question. Yes, it does. Thanks, Nate. Uh, who is uh, William? I saw you flash. Or was that Learn, an, learning to take a deep what? breath before I ask questions? Um, so I've had some pretty, um, some really intense trips with dimethyl tryptamine DMT, and it's I I sense that there were forces, uh, manifest forces that were guiding my destiny, and I wondered if you could relate with that, like if you had ever had those kind of trips, and and if that. Um, yeah, just leave it with that. And a short answer. Yes. I think anybody who's really dove into psychedelics, especially DMT or 5-MeO DMT or, you know, ayahuasca, I mean, ultimately they're all, you know, the base of DMT, but, um, uh, has experienced, uh, the same thing on, uh, on, in different dimensions and other states of consciousness that, uh, defy reasoning and, have come in contact with intelligence and whatnot. And there's, you know, a lot of, uh, I don't want this, this, I guess goes to show that we really are overdue for doing a psychedelic room. So I think maybe Thursday night, um, I think that might be the topic. We might finally do a, another one because it is a part of the club and a big component um, of consciousness and of this, this topic that can be expanded upon. Um, so it's probably better, better served for, for that room. But um, in a short answer, yes. Um, I've encountered them. I, I know Silver has. Uh, Scotty, I can't speak for you, but I'm pretty confident to say that's probably a probably a ten four. Um, yeah, Scotty, I didn't hear if you if you said something. I didn't hear it. He's unmuted. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, I mean it is a big component to it, um, and also this is another thing that has been completely unjustly. Uh, vilified and uh, uh, really just done a major disservice. The, psych the psychedelic movie, we're talking about stigma and, and the vilification of something that has been used for tens of thousands of years uh, that ultimately, if you've ever read Brian Moresco's Immortality, he, we now know has been a fundamental part of all religions throughout the world and was a part of all of their religious sacraments that they've now been able to archaeochemical date these religious vas vessels going back through Eleusis and Christianity and Hinduism all over the world and finding the traces of, you know, things like DMT, uh, psilocybin or Amini and muscaria. 
uh, a number of other psychedelic compounds, argot, that they were all, and uh, you know, THC, these things were all within these uh, religious vessels of sacrament. Uh, we can now trace these things. That was what his 10 years of study was, was to go back to these ancient relics and uh, with the technology we now have to find out exactly what was inside them, realize that uh, that was completely a part of it and, uh, and possibly, you know, a part of the formation of all religion and that contact with, you know, source and understanding of all those things. Um, as is the UFO phenomena, but those are also <laughs> deep conversations for uh, rooms that are uh, targeted specifically towards you know UFOs and psychedelics in ancient history, which we have done before and we'll, we'll no doubt do again, um, uh, as well as um, uh, just as it pertains to the phenomena itself um, and the encounters therein uh, with energies and entities and things that. Uh, uh, defy understanding but are incredibly real and for people who haven't also read it if you want two great books that will uh, really change your life and your understanding as it pertains to these altered states of consciousness uh, that are very grounded in science uh, one is the uh, the spirit molecule dmt the spirit molecule by dr strassman who did the first clinical uh, studies with uh, dmt in the 90s uh, there's a short documentary based on the book but the book is a million times better and more detailed, and then uh, Brian Marescu's Immortality Key, which I previously uh, mentioned. Those will be some uh, great required reading if NNT was a university. Um, so uh, highly recommend that. But uh, the, the the short answer, uh, William, is is yes. But it's just I don't think it's a, a path we can we can really go down tonight without completely derailing the uh, the conversation. But we will do. Uh, we will do a psychedelic room, and I'll I'll talk to the guys and see about doing it, um, uh, possibly Thursday. Um, but uh, hopefully that helps. Um, appreciate you, man. Appreciate you being here. Uh, who would be next? Flash your mic. Uh, Shaba, you changed your profile picture. Hello, my dear. Good to see you. Hello. How are you? I am walking in the lion, in the spirit of the lion, recently. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the mods, you know, for keeping up the room. Nate, Silver, Data, Joker, Troby, Haley, Scotty, and the ladies. I love you so much. And Nate, I love you too. Um, I love this room. And that is what I want to say because this is such an amazing space for people to come and express. It's actually a safe space. I was in the other room over the week. And I'm telling you, some people are just not ready to hear it, you know. You may have all the files in the world, but if someone is convinced that something is not true, it doesn't matter how many, you know, research or proof you show them, they're not going to believe it. But then at the same time, you have to remember that all of us, especially those who have been on a spiritual journey, is that we did not wake up one day and believe in the things. You know, some of us, it took us time. Some people, it took them years. So you have to kind of understand where they're coming from. And in that moment, you have to plant your seed, you know. And I think maybe 10 years from now, five years from now, they'll be like, oh, my God, what Ned was saying, you know, is actually true. What that guy was saying is true. And, it, you know, these things happen. So... For me, I always come in this room to say thank you guys for what you're doing. I think it's really amazing. And uh, also catching the rest of the world up to what is happening because I feel like in the next probably four, five, 10 years, there's going to be way more UFO activity around. And uh, people who you know were not believing in the beginning, I believe it's great to have such spaces where they get the right information, you know, where it's not just conspiracy theories and people are scared of, you know, weird looking creatures and all of that. And I think in a way we also, uh, it helps us alter our consciousness to more levels to understand that we are not the only beings in the entire universe. And in that way, you know, we open our mind up to all possibilities and, you know, from learning uh, other things, you know, and, uh, trying to connect to other celestial beings if they're there. So yeah, so I'm always happy to be here, I always appreciate this space, and I'm always happy to see that people are entering into that era where they, you know, they're starting to believe, you know, even if it, it may be on a small scale, it doesn't matter, the seed has been planted, and two years from now, three years from now, it will truly grow, and it will help people to awaken to other states of consciousness, you know, if they give themselves time. So, um, Thank you guys for keeping down the boom and I'll step by and listen to other people talking. 
Thank you, Ashaba. And I swear to everybody in the audience, we did not pay her for that. Um, <laughs> good to see you as always. Uh, you're quite the bright light, so we're always happy to have you on stage, Ashaba. Thank you. Um, well, uh, as I think you all saw, the hand raising's off. I just, uh, I'll spare Haley a prolonged reset. Probably going to go another 30 minutes or so. Um, this is Nate Night Talks, UFO and Government Disclosures, a week in review. We recap the last seven days of disclosure, uh, the narrative, everything therein, with the backdrop of the last 80 years of what's been going on within the government as it pertains to this subject matter, so you have a better, more clear lens to look through and decipher information and what is being said and what is not being said. Um, as always, thank you so much to everybody who is here hanging out with us, uh, who has spoken so far on the stage. Thank you to my wonderful mods. You're all incredible. Um, please, if you enjoy the club, uh, and you enjoy the mods and anybody who spoke, give it a follow on the club, click the bell because I'm terrible at pinging and there's no organized way to ping people on clubhouse. And I know a lot of you DM me saying, please ping me in the next room. There's just no way. There's no way it can be done. But if you click the bell, um, you'll get notified. And we definitely want you uh, coming back. And we also want to hear from you. So uh, follow the mods. Follow the people who spoke. Follow the people who are next to you in the audience. Because if you've been here for any length of time, hanging out, you're all of probably a similar like mind or at least a similar curiosity. And you're all here for the same reason. So follow each other. Build that community. That is what Clubhouse is for. And we need to exploit it to the uh, fullest potential. So. That being said, uh, just want to thank you all, send you all a bunch of love. We'll keep going for the last uh, half hour or so and give people who have not yet had a chance to speak a chance to speak. So if you would like to speak, it's a lot of speaks, please flash your mic. Uh, Tyler, I saw you went first, so you're up. Cool. Uh, thanks for uh, bringing me up. Um, I have a couple things to say. One is I work in political uh, media and have for a while, and I know everybody here was talking about uh, whether or not to trust the media and you were saying that you can't really trust the media you need to look at it for to it for yourself and i came over my years of being involved in political media and things like that uh i've come up with this phrase of true news travels in niches and um i definitely think that you're right that you you do have to delve into the things that you are interested in one of the things you realize when you work in in the media, uh, involved in really anything and is, um, and you pay attention to news stories about it is you realize how little the media is correct when it's reporting on something that you actually know a lot about. And, um, so if you do want to look into like things like this, you have to kind of delve into the community involved in this and see what they have to say instead of waiting for the New York times or things like that. But, um, so I just wanted to say that I agree with that. Uh, my questions are um, uh, related to the timing. Um, I had one statement about the timing and then one question about um, Chaim Ashed, the head of um, uh, Israeli space agency uh, for quite some time, his statements. Um, my one statement about why now is just some thoughts is that, you know, when you see in the past and that these things have been heavily involved around nuclear weapons. And uh, even now we have, you know, COVID going on and that's kind of a technological, I guess, byproduct. If you, I mean, I think it is at least you might not, but I do. And, um, and you look at where physics is kind of when you're looking at the fringes of physics, it not even the fringes, but the, the emergent physics uh, that's coming out with Stephen Wolfram, Eric Weinstein, uh, Clear Irwin, people like this, it does look like we're about to have like a jump in physics understanding, which does lead to like a jump in technology. So that these things might explain why they're the why now to some degree. But my one question is about Chaim Ashed statements about that, uh, you know, that he said that the United States has had an agreement with extraterrestrials for decades and they know that they're there and uh, that they have a tree with them to do scientific, you know, tests. And that guy was, you know, the head of, he, I mean, he basically created Israel space agency. And I know that when you look into the past of area 51 and you look at, you know, Bob Lazar's statements as well, he said that, I think I remember he said that he was told this as well. And a number of other people in this community have echoed it. Do you think that it's possible or just getting everyone's general thoughts 
what what if i mean i guess it's not the government necessarily or even lockheed martin and these defense contractors that is leading either the disclosure or the cover-up i mean wouldn't if if there is if you are believing what these people have said uh that there is scientific experiments going on on earth by extraterrestrials and that our government or other governments know about it wouldn't it make sense that they would want that kept quiet and if they did could that explain why this has been such a secret i mean it is the ultimate cover up if it's if it's true that they've known about this for quite some time so that's my question i guess well i'll say this to the high thing um I have heard that, uh, and this is also <laughs> uh, makes a perfect uh, point of what I was saying earlier about the, the amount of disinformation and lying from the, the media and the government is so great that it's just caused this level of apathy and absolute confusion of not knowing what the truth is anymore, let alone where to find it. I've heard that the Haim thing was uh, was supposedly bunk, that he, you know, it was some fringe article that it came in. I, I read it, uh, I referenced it in a number of rooms, you know, months ago, because um, he dove into a lot of stuff that uh, is very well known uh, within the, the, the UFO, you know, community of, of researchers and whatnot, as well as the whistleblowers, as well as bases on Mars and the moon. And things that we've all heard about uh, that have taken place within the secret space program since, you know, the 1940s when we got the the two crash ships at Roswell, and, you know, Bob Lazar, who talked about, you know, others that we retrieved in Antarctica and uh, or dug up in Antarctica and found in Egypt and among other places. There's a lot that goes in into that and his story, uh, you know. Uh, basically validates all that. And I was like, holy shit, this is like, this is real disclosure. Like this is the biggest bombshell ever. This is what the UFO community has been waiting for uh, as far as real disclosure. That's what real disclosure would look like. Um, And then uh, heard that it was actually in one of our, uh, in in one of the the rooms, the Nate Night Talk room, where I think I was referencing it. And somebody can't remember who and mods of maybe you remember that, uh, feel free to chime in who, who said it, but supposedly that it was, uh, it was found to be uh, falsified or disinformation or, or whatever the case may be. But I also think that that in itself uh, could very well be the disinformation that, uh, you know, he's, he said things, he said things he wasn't supposed to say. And yeah, you talk about pedigree, you talk about, uh, you know, clearance, you talk about all this stuff. He had it, I had it like he, you know, as, as you stated, um, he he would know these things and for him to come out as someone that level granted he is advanced in age and so that uh, was also i think other things people were saying that he was like he's senile or something like there there was there was a number of bunk how much of that is just the skeptics doing anything they can to smear somebody immediately when they come out um who who is very credible <laughs> i mean it doesn't get much more credible than than that um and 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 said it and so i haven't really kind of touched it then just for the sake uh of uh, not wanting to put out something that uh is kind of riddled with uh i don't know skepticism right now of, of the validity to the story um but uh i've actually been meaning to dive back into it and really search for myself but i did hear that as it pertains to the high end thing um that it might not in fact be a legitimate uh story but um, we will see uh, whether that's the case. But everything he, he did say uh, is definitely things that uh, I subscribe to, uh, that I've come across in my research, that uh, there's been enough whistleblowers at high levels, people who are, uh, I would say, credible, um, uh, various deathbed confessions of people who you know were worked on certain teams uh, with S4 and S2, uh, who've talked about this, the whole, you know, Eisenhower incident of him, you know, threatening to invade Area 51 with the first army out of Colorado because they wouldn't tell him what was going on there. And he was the last president to ever know this. And he sent his advisors after that because they let him in and they showed him, you know, uh, the crashed UFOs from Roswell, ones that we were currently working on reverse engineering, live, uh, live alien body, as well as three dead ones. And so, they went back and reported that to him, and that was the end of it. And the last thing he gave was his farewell address, warning the world about the military-industrial complex, that it is now free of checks and balances, doesn't answer to anybody, 
um, and that we should be very, uh, very afraid of it. Um, and uh, so, you know, uh, yeah, uh, a deeper conversation for an intro room like this uh, of the 101. Um, but uh, I've, I've definitely uh, heard those things. Um, and I, I, I do believe that in a, a very, very clandestine special access program kind of way that is beyond a level of secrecy that I think most people are aware uh, exist. And, uh, and I know data has come across a number of these uh, type of security uh, classifications uh, and clearances um, and his, uh, his work, uh, you know, uh, protecting such sensitive information for the alphabet agencies and, and Joe as well. And so, it's uh, it's something that obviously you know. There's uh, what proof uh, can you you really give um, outside of you know uh, a number of whistleblowers who worked in these projects who, who came forward and said this is what's happening, <laughs> and uh, either they lost their lives or they got smeared, and their reputations destroyed. As is the now the the mo of uh, of intelligence agencies because if you if you take somebody out, uh, it, it validates what they say. And they can become a martyr. But if you smear them and destroy them, uh, a la Julian Assange, then uh, then the credibility is lost and you've destroyed their life and you just hope that they kill themselves. And that is also what a number of uh, – that was actually what Dr. Morehouse even said, uh, who worked for the CIA under Project Stargate, that that was what they tried to do to him, was to smear him to a point that they hoped he would just kill himself. Um, and, uh, and he didn't, and he ended up winning. Um, but uh, that that is the MO. Uh, and so – yeah. Um, did I answer the question or was there a separate question to that? Um, I guess you basically answered it. The, my main question was just like, do you, even Chaim aside, do you, if you do believe in the secret space program and uh, do you believe that that is a partnership with uh, other civilizations or do you think that's just us reverse engineering because if it is a partnership it would i'm just saying it which i don't know you know but if it is it would make sense that uh that we might not be the ones leading the charge of disclosure or classific or classifying you know this data so that was my my main question but you did you dove into all, all the things that i you know think about all the time too so it was uh you gave an answer based on my research Yes, I think that is the case. That, that, that there's a, a yeah, partnership. That, yeah, that signs point to that, uh, and and it's uh, what that entails. Uh, you know how how ongoing that is. What type of communication exists? I don't know if it was a one time conversation that was had, and it was like uh, you aren't leaving this planet because you're a bunch of war fearing you know, war fearing you know. Uh, primitive beasts who uh, now have split the atom and have become an existential threat, not just to yourselves and this planet, but, you know, to other civilizations as well. Um, and so we've been kept in check ever since then, um, which would also, you know, make more sense. Cause if you think about it, if you really think about what's happening with disclosure right now and that these things are flying around, right. They're all over We're they're in our airspace. They're flying with impunity. They're, you know, deactivating our nuclear weapons. They're doing all of this stuff. And this has been documented and declassified. And obviously now everything that we're seeing, what makes more sense is that and this has been going on for 80 years and we've been aware of this and we've continued to see these things and the government's been aware of it. It, it seems to stands to reason that uh, if we've, if this has been happening and we've deliberately kept it hush hush, that there's just been a free pass that's been given. Like, yeah, I guess you're going to do this. Like, here's, here's the, the arrangement, uh, you know, they're going to be flying around and we know it's them and we're not going to do anything about it. Like, and, and they have, they've, they've done this or hasn't, they, they don't shoot down our airplanes. There's nothing that's been uh, any type of, you know, uh, hostile aggression. They've just been cruising around doing their thing, doing whatever it is that they're doing. Um, and it would, you know, seem to make sense that, uh, some type of an agreement was met and, you know, at a, at a very deep level of, of government, not at all. It's something like the president or, you know, people on the Hill or Pentagon would be aware of, but, uh, on that, that very deep, deep, uh, compartmentalized, um, you know, mix of military industrial complex, like skunk works, phantom works and et cetera. And, uh, and these, these clandestine operations, you know, at S4 and, you know, Kings Peak and, you know, all the others. And so that uh, it would seem to make sense uh, that that would be the case, that these things have been doing this 
uh, like they've had permission and <laughs> like they didn't even need permission, I guess. I mean, given the technology they possess, what are we going to do? Say no. Um, but, uh, but yeah, anyway. Um, and I don't know if any of the mods had anything that they, uh, takes on that that they wanted to, uh, to add. If so, go ahead. Otherwise we'll keep it going. And we're going. Uh, all right. Um, thank you, Tyler. Um, uh, flash thank Mike, you. if you'd like to, uh, go next, Sebastian, I saw you flash. You're up. Hi, thanks. Uh, yeah, so I, I listened in on one of the previous uh, rooms uh, you guys had, and there was a discussion about these latest pieces of footage, all the ones that are kind of uh, opening the door to this report, right? The gimbal, the Tic Tac, and there was speculation going back and forth whether these are vehicles maybe that the that our own government is testing um, to either drones, right? Or some kind of, somebody mentioned like, oh, maybe it's a hologram that's that could be used as like a decoy in a warfare scenario. And they're testing it on our own troops, right? Uh, but maybe it's even simpler than that. Cause like, what what do we really have? We, we really have just like these blurry, uh, videos from infrared right and then some years later after these trickled out um uh, we have a guy that says he saw this stuff but it, he's you know he's just a guy with a story so what what are we really looking at right and, and it's i mean i've been following um kind of ufo topics for a while and uh i have yet to see anything convincing at all like all the there's so many it's so it's a field so fraught with you know things like stan romanek and billy meyer and all these people who create fake images and videos uh and all kinds of people with crazy stories like Whitley stream with uh the, i mean he's a storybook writer and he, he's aliens i just how how likely do you guys think uh, it is, you know, that this whole phenomenon is just uh, concocted by people with their own individual agendas? I think it's highly unlikely. Uh, <laughs> and I don't know if you really dove into the research of the UFO community. I don't think anybody has ever framed Whitley Strieber's communion book as uh, as anything other than an intelligent analysis of this phenomena and abductees uh, co-authored with, you know, a Harvard psychiatrist uh, doing a deep dive in, into this phenomena. Um, and as it pertains to, you know, the gimbal tic tac and go fast, uh, yeah, these this happened. You know, the the Tic Tac in particular in two thousand one, and uh, there was no modality for them to communicate this stuff. I mean, they did. Everybody saw it. This was corroborated by four Top Gun pilots. You know, so the best of the best within our military, you know, air fleet, uh, who who witnessed this, who saw it, who who witnessed it do all this. It was backed up by radar um on the ship on the Nimitz itself and then when they sent up the next uh the next fighter jet equipped with all the uh the actual radar equipment and lidar and every other you know infrared heat signature detecting uh software that they had uh they went up and caught it as well and you know days before that they had the fleet of a hundred of these things flying uh, off the coast of baja at eighty thousand feet which dropped down to 20 feet above sea level in half a second the same thing happened off the atlantic these were uh, the with the gimbal and the go fast these were witnessed by the pilots by the radar technician this uh, you have basically three points of uh, of corroborated uh, evidence for you know one particular sighting it's not just a visual contact uh it's a visual contact and uh then radar contact and then heat signature contact um of showing that there is no form of visible propulsion on these things they were operating outside the laws of you know uh, what we would say accepted physics it doesn't necessarily defy it in a, a level that we you know at a quantum level that we're not fully grasping yet but does exist uh, as far as certain scientific explanation goes but not something that we believe is possible based on anything that we're capable of doing now um so i would say that uh, you know that that evidence is is pretty solid and there is you know a fair amount of quality footage out there but you're right this is what was spoke about in the very beginning of the room uh, as it pertains to the amount of uh, 
of fake footage that's out there, uh, disinformation deliberately deliberately planted, but also uh, the inability to capture. I mean, you're looking at something that is anywhere from you know five thousand to ten thousand up feet in the air, and you're trying to capture it on a cell phone video or some prehistoric camera. If you're going back, you know, in the early two thousands and before, uh, the quality of cameras. Uh, that existed then uh, trying to get anything at a distance. Like, I, I don't know where the disconnect is with a lot of people and understanding how, how shitty that image is going to look, uh, especially with an iPhone. Uh, you don't have an optical zoom. It's just a digital zoom. And if something's that far away and you're zooming in with your digital zoom and your camera is going to become pixelated to high hell and it's not going to be a compelling piece of evidence. But the testimony that backs these things up, the declassified documents, the expert testimony, the whistleblowers, the, the historical significance of ancient history and various religions around the world that reference these things, uh, there's, there's a big story that uh, comes together if we take all the pieces of, of, of evidence and compile them uh, and see that something has been happening since the dawn of humanity. And, uh, and it's been echoed throughout time and possibly labeled with different things based on understanding at the time. And we're encountering this now with the new understanding and having a new identification for it. Scotty, was that you that wanted to say something? Or is that data? That's me. Yeah, it's, it's data. Hey, uh, you know, I, yeah, I really try to approach everything from a, from a scientific stance. And uh, when I started researching... Uh, this topic, uh, I went in with complete skepticism. I see there's no way that this is, is this is crazy, you know. Um, you know, I don't believe I don't I, I can't mean I I don't believe in aliens. I don't believe in ghosts. I don't I don't I don't believe in demons. I don't believe in any of that. So I had to choose one, right? And I didn't choose aliens. I didn't choose you know unidentified flying objects. I, t- I chose I chose uh, demons and I chose uh, um, ghosts and 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 when i was finally able to find the whatever i needed you know the proof that i needed to say that there's no for my personal thing on on this um yeah this you know phenomenon i have a link at the very bottom of my bio and i spoke about this at the very beginning it's about crop circles and i and 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 it's i know someone sent me a dm and i corrected the link uh, by the way, for anyone that's still here from the beginning, I corrected the link, and it is a link for crop circles. And uh, I, I specifically reference page 54. And the only question that I'd like to propose to you, when if, when you look at this uh, document, and it is from the military, it is uh, it is completely available for public approved for, approved for public release. The question that you should ask yourself is, what am I looking at? And there's a little caption at the bottom of the image on page 54 that says crop circles. What am I looking at? And when you continue reading, you can form your own form your own opinion. Excuse me, about what you're looking at, and read the data that actually is is given to you. That something that we still don't know is creating these crop circles and leaving a heat signature. You know, Nate was talking about specifically, the, you know, the heat the heat signatures that we can tell. Uh, you know, or or the you know the lack of, or or their you know the, the capture of, right? We we don't know what it is that's leaving these marks in our earth, and there's not just one or two or a hundred. There's thousands at any time. And if you look at the other pictures that science has shown is showing you, there's thousands of crop circles at every time, every single day on this planet. And so something just to, to, to share with you, just at the very bottom of my bio. So thank you, I'm Data. Nate, can I say something very small? Uh, yeah, Shaba. And then uh, after that, once again, we're going to be closing up. So if you haven't yet had a chance to speak after Shaba, please flash your mic. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to say that if you look at the videos that most of the pilots captured, I can speak from the pilot's view as a pilot, and I can tell you that they know before they share such information that everything is on stake, you know, you could lose your license for coming off as cool, cool, or crazy or something like that, especially if you're flying a plane. But the fact that someone is flying and can take off the time to put that plane in autopilot and capture 
whatever they see, it means that it is also beyond them. Because when you are flying, you know, in the space, uh, the controls know where you are, you know, whatever altitude you're supposed to be flying on, you know where your plane is supposed to be at. And when you are in that space and you see some other object in that space, which you do not expect to see there, and beyond that, you see it moving in ways it shouldn't be moving because we know the laws of aviation, you know, you know the the forces that act on a plane in flight. So when you see that, you know, that object doing these weird maneuvers going like as if it's defying gravity, I think no pilot would just share such information if they didn't know that, you know, their license was on stake because that is the most important thing to a pilot. But if someone shares it, it means that that is their truth. For me, that is what I go by. I know that the person who shared that, I saw one where the object was moving in such weird ways that you know that there is no way a real plane would move like that. But beyond that, for me, I trust the person who says that because if you share that information, your license is at stake. You know, they're going to take it away from you. They're going to say you're, you're seeing all these things that are not supposed to be there. But the, first, the, the fact that the person takes out time to use their phone to capture that image, I think that is something that you should also look into and know that people who share this information, they also have a lot to lose, you know? They don't just put it out there because they're looking for attention or something like that. So the reason they put it out there is because it's beyond comprehension and they want the rest of the world to know. So I just wanted to say that to Sebastian. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ashaba, uh, and 100% true. Uh, that is the case and has been the case. And, uh, and sadly, a lot of these people wait until they retire to come forth with these things. And then people are like, oh, well, that happened so long ago. Like, well, yeah, they would have lost their job. Um, their wings would have been clipped if they would have came forward with a lot of this information in the past. So a lot of people wait till they don't have anything to lose anymore. And they come forward and they're like, all right, I, I've been holding this in for so long. And I've seen people break down and cry telling these stories of, of things that were so profound, so life-changing that happened to them, that they saw, that they witnessed, and they had no way to tell anybody. Uh, and they had to keep it in for risk of, of losing their, their livelihood uh, for, for saying that they, they experienced this and saw this particular thing. And that's just, uh, it's absolutely terrible. Uh, it's absolutely terrible. And I, that is the, the big issue with uh, the way the government has handled this and why we're skeptical now about why they're coming out with it uh, in the way that they are um, and why it's going to be a very crafted narrative that makes sure that they don't have to admit any wrongdoing for the lives that they destroyed uh, because of the, the stigmatization that they put forth within this subject matter and dating back to the 70s. And so it's a very, very, uh, very real reality. Um, but, uh, but thank you for sharing, Nishaba. Um, uh, anybody else who's not yet had a chance to speak, please flash your mic. Uh, Vina, you are up. Hi, Nate. Um, I just wanted to come in with a view from Australia because a lot of this, a lot of the talk has been pretty much US centric, and uh, the Australian, I guess, would say media. We've we've shown. I don't know if anyone here in the audience is from Australia, but have seen the Channel 7 um, documentary on this particular topic. I think it's called Phenomenon. And they have aired it quite a few times in the last two weeks. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to watch that. But they did show footage of probably the same that's been shown in the States with the um, the Tic Tac and, you know, the the intelligence of the of the UAP returning to the cat points and, um, and to, to the point of you know, pilots and any anyone else in the um, in the Navy, the Air Force coming forward, you know, high top secret types, they definitely will risk losing their um, their licenses and their credibility. Um, just from my own personal background, I grew up living a few streets away from a military base. We would call it an army base here in Australia. Um, I have had my own experiences <laughs> and in the last 10, 20, 30 years would not even speak about that because I also have a, I have a security clearance, um, a, so it's a police clearance from my role, my job. So even, even that, you know, coming into it, being a sceptic as well, I like to gather lots of data points. Um, but I have a YouTube channel and it's, it's only small, but I am interviewing Australia's probably leading UFO researcher. He's had about 50 years experience um, as a researcher, as an experiencer, as an author. So I don't know that many people <laughs> who are even 50 on this, in, this, in this room right now. So 
lots of evidence, lots of lots of anecdotal for sure sightings, experiences. But just to get um, his bird's eye view of, of why this is coming out now, and I, and I agree with Nate and everyone else, um, the agendas, the narratives need to be looked at. I think we can't underestimate <laughs> the deception that's been deployed. I, uh, if I could say anything about the consciousness levels, the intelligence levels, the, the scientific aspects of what I like to look at it from a divergent perspective. And if anyone knows with the technology adoption life cycle, how you've got the early adopters, the early majority, the late majority and the laggards, you can easily map that across with what's going on here in the community. Um, at the moment, I believe that the scientific community and the media and the mainstream are at that the peak of the bell curve. At the top, you've got a lot of people that are at the, the early, you know, the ahead, they're at the wave, and a lot of them are coming forward with intel um, in regards to the UAP UFO report that's about to come out. There is someone that I'm in touch with that, and, you know, again, hearing lots of people discuss their experience. This is somebody that has been in a secret space program. So this is obviously their testimonials. Um, but she released something yesterday about what would not be disclosed in this UAP UFO report and to, and to really be mindful, cognizant and um, discerning about why they're releasing this and that the, the most, the best that they're going to reveal is that there are <laughs> Um, unidentified flying objects and UAPs, but they are not going to officially disclose um, the top secret <laughs> info, like the secret space programs, the black ops ops, solar wooden programs, dark fleet, um, you name it, planetary corps. I think with what some of the moderators said before about going to the people that have knowledge that isn't within the mainstream industry like the experiences and yes not maybe be believing it immediately but gathering as much information from the last couple of decades and just hearing these stories and their testimonials because um you know there's a lot of space quantum leap my labs stuff there's a lot of disinfo there's a lot of misinfo um all all that all that kind of jazz um but yeah just the one the one thing i will just say is I think Arthur Arthur Schopenhauer, his, his quote about all truth passing through three stages, that first it is ridiculed and then it's violently opposed and then third it's being accepted as being self-evident. And I really ascribe to the notion that perhaps this, this could take us into the next quantum leap of consciousness and that um, there are multiple paths up a mountain. And I think if we can bring the scientific community along with us, I think we need to be very mindful um, of the conversations they, that they require to get on board um, and to have, you know, incredible thought leaders such as yourself, Nate, and, and anyone else that's able to bridge that gap and that chasm between the woo-woo consciousness and the scientific, the intel that's coming forth from experiences and those that tes testify that they've been in secret space programs. Um, and that's all I'll say. Uh, um, yeah. So that's just coming from an Australian perspective. So hopefully in the next couple of weeks, um, I'll be able to get that interview slash potential doco out. And that's just from an Australian perspective. So I'm Vina and I'm done. Well, we definitely value the Australian perspective. And I know Haley with the curls uh, uh, from Perth. No, you're not from Perth. From Melbourne? From Melbourne. Melbourne, <laughs> I knew that. My bad. Uh, I know she definitely, uh, I got to stop the Aussie accent. Uh, I know she definitely appreciates it. Um, and I agree. I agree with the, with everything you said. Um, and you know, for people who are new to this subject, you should look into the Westall incident, uh, in 1966 in Australia, also one of the biggest recorded mass sightings in, uh, in UFO history took place in Australia. There is a whole lot that has been going on within the indigenous population of Australia for thousands of years and a lot of, uh, a lot of deep dive in the research therein, uh, as far as it pertains to their relationship with, uh, with beings not of this planet and knowledge that they had. Um, there is a lot to dive in. Um, uh, on Monday nights, it seems to always end up being U.S. centric because this is the U.S. story uh, that's coming through the Pentagon. And I think out of all countries, 
uh, we are definitely been the one that's been kept in the dark the most. Our government has taken such an active stance at uh, keeping this information uh, suppressed um, that uh, it's a, a bigger deal, I think, than it is uh, in, in other countries um, who've been a little more transparent with these things. Not to say that you know most of our allies have been, I think, in a similar uh, similar stance with it, but um, the South America, Central America, Mexico have been incredibly forthcoming with this. Uh, Africa has as well uh, historically with certain uh, incidents. Um, I mean, sadly, the, the West Hall incident in Australia was majorly suppressed and the, the teachers who were there were threatened uh, and they came forward as well um, with losing their job and their livelihood if they said anything or corroborated these kids' stories. Um, this, this level of secrecy and suppression, you know, it, it transcends borders, but I think it's, you know, a lot of this stuff sadly does perpetuate from the U.S. It's a giant media mouthpiece to the world in many ways for, for good or for bad, usually for bad. Um, but uh, here it's, this is a big deal because I think people in this country have been very, very programmed, uh, possibly more so than in other places, to really view this subject in an incredibly negative, pious kind of manner. That's like it's absurd and that if you think this stuff that you're some tinfoil hat wearing kook and you're not educated and you're not scientific and you're, you're all these other slanders that uh, they want to throw out and it's insulting to people who do have high IQs and are very intelligent people who happen to stumble across things or saw things that they couldn't unsee and became incredibly fascinated by it and researched it you know, thoroughly because they realized, as I think a lot of people are going to start to realize, that this is the biggest story there is. This, this changes everything uh, and in a beautiful incredible way uh, it expands everything not just you know our consciousness uh, which is the most important part but you know our technology our place in the universe we're joining our galactic neighbors and, and realizing that you know and, and unifying ultimately as one race instead of constantly being divided amongst ourselves and fighting and warring and fearing the other and like uh, it's we're one we're all one there is no other in this i mean there is no other period but especially as it pertains to the human race, we're all one. We're all one. And, uh, and I think that would be a, one of the most uniting, uniting things there could be is, uh, is realizing that, you know, similar to, you know, the UN or all the countries of the world that represent different races and nationalities and cultures, it's the same thing on a galactic scale. And that we, uh, we are really one, one giant race of, of, of people and species. And it's, uh, that's an incredible, incredible thing. And so there's, there's so much that makes this, I think, the most important story there is, uh, and, and that the people who really dedicated their lives because of things they saw, experienced, whether within the government or on a personal level, uh, and, and, and studied this with, uh, with honesty, integrity, and discernment to the best of their ability, despite being ridiculed, despite having to sift through so much bullshit, so much counterintelligence, so much, you know, heat from everybody else. Like, uh, I, it's, it's really sad and it, it really bothers me every time I think about it. I am grateful for what's happening now. Uh, and I, I really hope that it, it continues and that, uh, this, this narrative, uh, doesn't turn into what I think a lot of people think it might. But um, ultimately, all we can do is just be aware. We're, we're only responsible for our own consciousness and our own understanding. We have sovereignty over that and nobody else. We're creating our reality every second of every day. And we have to realize that and, uh, and really approach the subject with that same understanding, uh, especially if we're new to it, um, and, and take that control and keep it very close. But um, yeah, I, mean, I think I remember, I think you shot me a DM. Um, so whatever you do have that... Uh, uh, interview, shoot me a link to it. Uh, I'll be happy to, to check it out and, uh, and happy that you're, you're in Oz, uh, doing the same thing, do, doing the good work. Um, so, so keep it up. <laughs>